you know it's this. Take a perk and talk it and see. Money swallowing like six. Did it perfect to the kid. Got a million who's sick on my head. I'm nothing better. Put on a rub, I just win. I know we got a million dollars. The devil that's it and I chip it again. Hello and welcome back, fellow anime lovers, to Manga Muse. I am delighted to have you join us once again in the world of fanfiction and fantasy. This is the fourth part of What If Deku Finds Men's Watch Ultimatrix. Special note, this fanfic is written in a masterpiece of the incredible muffin on fanfiction.net. Do check and support the author too. Now smash the like, share and subscribe button for more. Also press the bell icon so that you never miss such great parts. Thanks for the introduction. Now let's dive into the world. Round 1. Begin. Basui crouched, ready to jump, and her tongue extended. She tensed when Shinso held out his hand. Before we really start, can I ask you a question? Sure, IG the words had barely left her mouth when Asui's body went slack. Good, Shinso said. He put his hands in his pockets and smirked. Now, turn around and walk out of bounds. Asui tried to fight it. But no matter what she did, her body refused to obey her commands. Slowly, almost like she was in a trance, she walked out of the ring. Asui has walked out of bounds, Midnight declared. The winner is Shinso. Asui shook her head as Shinso's quirk faded and she regained control of herself. She shuddered at the idea that someone could just control her like that. She then felt depressed at how easily she'd lost. Asui didn't let something like pride get in her way, but she'd thought she'd do better than that. Well, would you look at that? Present Mike sounded genuinely surprised. I wonder what Shinso-san did to make Asui leave the ring like that. It was his quirk. Obviously, Aizawa said calmly. Oh, if someone has such a powerful quirk, how come they're not already in the hero course? Simple it's a quirk that only works on people. The entrance exam uses robots for the practical portion, which makes quirks like Shinso's useless. Clearly, we need to revamp how we evaluate quirks. You want to bring it up at the next teacher's meeting, go right ahead. Still, let's give it up for Shinso, the first student to advance to the next round. That really sucks, Ashido said. Gone was her good cheer, she was genuinely sad that Asui had lost. Shinso-san has a powerful quirk, Yuraraka said nervously. Deku-kun, if you beat Shizaki-san, you'll have to go against him. Yeah, I guess, Midoriya mumbled. I have to beat Shizaki-san first, and I don't know enough about her quirk. Everyone else smiled fondly as Midoriya rambled, but all of their attention shifted when Asui rejoined them. Hey, Tsu, Siro said with an easy smile. How are you doing? Asui sat next to him, slumping more than usual. I feel like I let you all down, Ribbit. Nonsense. Ida waved his hand wildly, and Yuraraka had to lean out of the way to avoid getting chopped on the head. You had no idea what Shinso-san was capable of, and you were still able to make it to the top 16 in your very first sports festival. If anything, this is something to be proud of. Asui managed a tiny smile. Thanks, Ribbit. Yeyurazu leaned over and hugged her. Just look at this as a milestone, a hurdle to surpass next year. She's right, Siro said with a grin. And with those jumping skills, you'll totally get over that hurdle. Asui's smile grew, somewhat worryingly, so did Ashido's. Subtle way to compliment her on her legs, Siro, she said with a saucy grin. Wa Siro's composure finally broke, and his face went red. That's not what I meant. Asui blushed almost as badly as Siro did, and looked away. I wouldn't mind if he did. While the rest of the group either got embarrassed or laughed along with Ashido, the their other classmates were keeping an ear out for the next announcement. Thankfully, Shoji was there to tap Yuraraka on the shoulder. Yuraraka-san, your match is going to start in a few minutes, he said through an extra mouth. Technically, you should have been in a waiting room by now. Deep, thanks, Shoji-san. Sorry, guys, I gotta go. Yuraraka smiled nervously. See one of you in the finals. Good luck, Yuraraka. Ashido called out as the other girl ran off. Hey, Midoriya. Midoriya turned to face Asui, who had mostly regained her composure. I know that you have to get through your first round, but if you face Shinso-san, there's something you should know, Ribbit. Midoriya nodded. Sure, go ahead. I think his quirk has something to do with talking to him. She shrugged. Maybe you have to answer a question before he can control you, Ribbit. Thanks, Tsuyu. Midoriya smiled. That helps a lot. And if I do face him, I'll beat him for both of us. Let's get started with the next fight. From the Hero Courses Class 1A. He's the noble warrior with the demon inside. It's Takoyami Fumikage. Excited cheers greeted Takoyami as he stepped into the ring. Though he didn't react to it and settled for waiting stoically. And let's give it up for his opponent. Also from Class 1A, she's the girl who defies gravity, but doesn't need a broomstick to do it. Let's hear some applause for Yuraraka Achako. Unlike her opponent, Yuraraka shyly waved at the crowd as she walked. 
Her adorable nature and friendly response immediately endeared her to many in the crowd. Hi, Takoyami-san, she said. Congrats on making it to the final event. Takoyami inclined his head. Thank you, Yuraraka-san. Congratulations to you as well, your performance during the cavalry battle was unexpected, to say the least. All right, kids, are you done? Midnight sounded impatient, but her gentle smile told them that she didn't mind. Are you both ready? I am, Takoyami said. Yes, Midnight Sensei. Midnight raised her whip. All right, begin. Dark Shadow. I'll get her. Dark Shadow dashed out of his partner's torso, claws outstretched. Yuraka took a deep breath, placed her hand against her shoulder to apply her quirk, and then kicked off at a forward angle. Dark Shadow flew under her, but just close enough that Yuraka was able to twist and kick the living quirk in the head. The point of the kick wasn't to hurt Dark Shadow in fact. Nobody in her class was quite sure if Dark Shadow could be hurt but to shift her angle and send her flying towards Takoyami. She pressed her fingertips together. Release. With gravity suddenly restored, Yuraraka plunged straight towards Takoyami with one fist drawn back. She tried to punch the boy in the face but her move was telegraphed and Takoyami stepped aside. A good try, Yuraraka-san, Takoyami said. But it was quite obvious. And you're wide open. Dark Shadow added gleefully as he turned and grabbed Yuraraka by the leg. Yuraraka had no way of reaching Takoyami with Dark Shadow grabbing her. That left an option that had no guarantee of working. Acting quickly, she slapped Dark Shadow in the face. Considering that he was a shadow, albeit one with mass, she wasn't sure how zero gravity would work. But she had to try. Instead of floating harmlessly upwards, the quirk writhed in place. He couldn't seem to go anywhere. Hey, what gives? I can't move right. Before Yuraraka could even feel good about her minor victory, she felt a fist bury itself between her shoulder blades, and she fell to her knees. You seem to have forgotten that I am also capable of fighting, though I admit that I am not that skilled, Takoyami said as he grabbed her wrists. I will be freeing Dark Shadow now. Yuraraka tried to pull free, but Takoyami had leverage and forced her hands together. It was sloppy, but her fingertips still touched, releasing her quirk. This time, when Dark Shadow grabbed her, he just roared and threw her out of the ring. Yuraka is out of bounds. Midnight shouted. The winner is Takoyami. Talk about underestimating both fighters. Present Mike said. Yuraka definitely has more fight in her than it seems, and Takoyami doesn't let Dark Shadow do all the work for him. She kept shifting all of her attention from one target to another, Aizawa added. If she'd kept both of them in her field of vision... Neither of them would have been able to get the jump on her. Good point, co-hosts. Let's give it up for both of our competitors. Only Takoyami is moving on, but Yuraraka put up a good fight. As soon as the fight had ended, Takoyami had walked over to Yuraraka and extended a hand. Are you alright, Yuraraka-san? I apologize, Dark Shadow can become somewhat brutal when he is angry. Yuraraka accepted the helping hand. It's okay, Takoyami-san, I'm fine. Good luck in your next round. She was a little proud of herself for holding her head high and for holding back her tears until she was back inside her waiting room. I lost. I'm so sorry, mom, daddy. I wanted to do better. Midoriya was starting to get worried when Yuraraka didn't rejoin them after a few minutes. The next bout had already begun, but it didn't appear to be going anywhere anytime soon. Hiroshima was facing Tetsu Tetsu. But since both boys had almost identical quirks, the fight had turned into a if Midoriya was being honest kind of boring slugfist. Ida had already left to prepare for his match, and Midoriya had the idea to use something similar as an excuse. I think I'll head for my waiting room, he said, standing up. Can you all cheer on Ida for me? Sure thing, Midori. Ashido rested her chin in one hand and waved him off with the other. She seemed particularly invested in Kirishima's fight, but she did grin when Midoriya was gone. He's totally going to check on Yuraraka, right? Yeyurazu smiled. Without a doubt. Definitely, Ribbit. Siro grinned. Dude's totally gonna earn points with her. Like you earned with Sue. Ashido giggled as Siro and Asui blushed again, and then grinned at Yeyurazu. You're next, just so you know. Yeyurazu rolled her eyes. I have no intention of supplying you with ammunition. Challenge accepted. It didn't take long for Midoriya to find Yuraraka's room. But before he opened the door, he heard a voice. He wasn't one for eavesdropping, but he also didn't want to just barge in on Yuraraka's conversation, so he just stood there. I know, daddy, but I still wish I'd done better, not just for you, but for all my friends. We promised to make it to the final event, but well, yeah, I guess I kept that promise. But I didn't want to get knocked out during the first match, okay, thanks. I, uh, I need to go, I want to cheer on my friends, I love you too, bye. As soon as Yuraraka hung up, Midoriya opened the door. H, hey, Yuraraka, can I come in? 
Yuraraka yelped and spun around, her phone still in hand. It didn't escape Midoriya's notice that there were tears in her eyes. Oh, Deku-kun. Sure, come on in. Wait, how long were you outside that door? Jay, just long enough to hear the end of your call. He admitted. I'm really sorry, I just wanted to see how you were doing. Yuraraka smiled weakly as she put away her phone. Well, if you heard my call it really stinks that I didn't make it past the first match. I mean, I knew Takoyami was strong, so I didn't expect to win, but I didn't even land a hit on him. Midoriya frowned and walked closer. You're Araka, you shouldn't say that you didn't expect to win. You're amazing, and you put Dark Shadow out of commission. You should be proud. You're Araka blushed. Th thanks, Deku-kun. You know, you can call me by my first name here, right? Oh oh, all right. Sorry, Achako, I just he shrugged helplessly. And anyway, I just wanted to see if you were okay. I'll be fine, Yuraraka promised. So, uh, how's the match right now? It looks like it'll take a while. And Ida is waiting for his match with Hatsum. Midoriya hesitated, then stood next to her. I want to cheer for Ida, but he'll understand if I'm checking on you. Aw, that's so sweet, Deku-kun. Yuraraka leaned against him and smiled. Seriously, though, I'm just a little bummed out. I'll be cheering for you and all our friends, I promise. Still Midoriya swallowed nervously and then wrapped his arms around her. You did great today, even if you didn't win. Yuraraka sniffed, but didn't say anything. She just leaned into his embrace. Finally, after what seemed like forever, they heard present Mike announce that Kirishima's match had ended in a draw and that there would have to be a lesser contest to determine a winner. Hida is gonna be out there soon, Yuraraka said, and reluctantly pulled out of Midoriya's arms. I'll cheer him on for both of us, okay? Midoriya nodded. Sure thing. Yuraraka turned to leave, but then turned back. Um, Deku-kun. Yeah. For a second, Yuraraka almost gave in to her urge to kiss him on the cheek. Midoriya was just being so nice, and she almost couldn't help herself. She told herself that it was just a friendly thing. That there would be nothing beyond that and she almost believed it. However, her nerves failed her, and she stopped herself. Thanks again, she said, and then dashed out of the room. Good luck in Irmich by. Midoriya scratched his head as the door closed behind her. What was that about? Ben grinned. Oh, I have no idea. Yuraraka rejoined her friends in the stands just as Kirishima defeated Tetsu Tetsu in arm wrestling. Hey, guys. Good to see you. Achako, Yeyurazu said as Yuraraka sat between her and Nasui. You didn't bring Midori with you. Yuraraka blushed a little and shook her head. No, he's gonna wait until his match is called. How are you feeling, Achako? Asui asked. She smiled. I'm doing okay. Sue, I still wish I'd won. But Deku-kun got me out of the funk I was falling into. Ashido turned to her with a wide grin. And how did he do that? Still a little red in the face, Yuraraka tried to look dignified. That's between him and me. Ashido's smile only grew, but she didn't press. If you say so. Hey, they announced Ida's fight when we what the hell is he doing out there? Ida's friend stared as he came striding into the arena, completely decked out in support items. When questioned by Midnight, he explained that he and Hatsum had agreed that both of them using her creations was fair. What followed was a circus of a fight. Ida tried to take it seriously. But Hatsum used every opportunity to just advertise her creations. Also, Ida wasn't completely sure how to use the support items Hatsum had provided. That gave her the chance to explain said items in greater detail. She even hacked the sound system of the arena to better broadcast her words. By the time she got through the many support items she'd brought, the time had almost run out on the fight. Still, she was satisfied and deliberately walked out of bounds to give Ida the win. I'm so confused, Siro said, though he looked like he was on the verge of laughing. Yeyorazu seemed to be in the same boat. I believe that she used this match as a commercial. Ashido, on the other hand, had to fight through hysterics to speak. W well, at least Ida won, right? He's the first one of us to make it to the second match. Yeah, but he'll be going up against either you or Yamomo, Ribbit, Asui reminded her. Ashido pouted. Dang it, you're right. Speaking of which, Yeyorazu said, after Midoriya's match, we should head down to the waiting rooms, Ashido. Yeah, good idea. Ashido brightened as Ida returned. Hey, it's Billboard Sam. How does it feel to be a walking advertisement? Ida held himself up with as much dignity as he could, despite how his friends grinned at him. I will admit, I didn't expect my first match to be quite so silly. However, I am still moving on to the next bout. Unfortunately, I will be facing either you or Yamomo. Ashido went back to pouting. Yeah, I was kinda hoping that more of us would make it to at least the second fight. Sue and Yuraraka are out, only Yamomo or I are moving on, and Siro. Siro grimaced. 
Yeah, I'm facing Bakugo. He glanced behind him, where his opponent wasn't even deigning to look at anyone else. I'm not looking forward to that. Hey, if you manage to rip his eyebrows off with your tape, I'll pay you, Ashido offered. Okay, that would be funny if it didn't result in my death by explosion. Offer is still on the table. The six of them shared an uneasy chuckle, but then present Mike's voice caught their attention. All right, let's get ready for our next match. In class 1B, it's the topiary terror, the foliage fighter, the girl with the green hair. Give it up for Shizaki Ibarra. More than one girl couldn't help but feel a stab of jealousy as the 1B student arrived. She had a grace and beauty few of them could ever hope to match. Even the thorny vines that replaced her hair had an ethereal quality to them. Shizaki walked serenely, almost as if she was strolling through a garden, not heading to a fight. However, before the crowd could get too worked up, she raised her hand and looked up at the announcer's booth. Excuse me, she said in a voice that was soft and kind. Could you please refrain from introducing me with such aggressive titles? That is far from the image I wish to convey. I'm okay. Present Mike cleared his throat and continued. And her opponent from Class 1A. It's the boy that should never be underestimated, no matter how plain he looks. He's the wild card wonder. The transforming titan let's hear it from Midoriya Izuku. Unlike with Shizaki, who had cut off her own applause at the knees, the crowd went wild for Midoriya. Everyone had been shocked by what he had revealed so far, and the possibility of seeing more got them pumped up. For his part, Midoriya shyly waved as he walked into the ring, and tried not to feel too embarrassed. Ooh, this is gonna be awesome. Hado practically vibrated as she stared intently at the phone. Go, Midoriya-kun. You can do it. What do you think he'll turn into for this one? Amajiki asked. Tagata grinned. Going by his opponent, I think I may know this time. Greetings, Midoriya-san, Shizaki said with a polite bow. I have been surprised by you so far today. Truly, you have shown great talent. Taken aback by her almost matter-of-fact compliment, Midoriya hastily bowed back. Um, th thank you, Shizaki-san. Good luck, I guess, but I do plan to win. Shizaki nodded. As do I. Are both fighters ready? Midnight asked. Midoriya took a deep breath and then held his hand over the Ultimatrix. He had already made his decision and just needed to slap the dial. Ready. Shizaki clasped her hands together and closed her eyes. I am ready. Begin. Shizaki's vines writhed as they plunged into the ground. At the same time, Midoriya vanished in a flash of green light. The vines shot up from underneath him just as the light faded. Before they reached him, the vines burned to a crisp. Heat blast. The crowd gasped as they got a good look at Midoriya's latest transformation. Next to All Might, Gran Torino threw up his hands. Okay, I give up, he said. I knew he had a lot of forms, but there is way too much variety. How is that kid not dead from his own quirk? I believe that Nezu-san mentioned that his watch helps keep him stable, Night I said. Still, this one seems rather dangerous. It is, All Might confirmed. He used that one to defeat Namu. Considering how powerful he was, I'm a little worried for young Shizaki. I hope young Midoriya knows what he's doing. Interesting, Shizaki said calmly. Your heat can kill my vines before they even reach you. Heat Blast shrugged. You can just surrender if you want. I appreciate the offer, but for the honor of my class, I must persevere. Shizaki's expression grew more determined. And while I cannot hit you with my vines, there are other things I can do. To Heat Blast's surprise, Shizaki's vines plunged into the ground again. This time, they ripped out a chunk of stone and hurled it at him with the force of a catapult. How strong are her vines? He thought as he threw himself to the side, and then sent a column of fire at his opponent. With lightning-fast reflexes, Shizaki ripped another piece of the ring up to block his fire. Okay, so her quirk is fast and strong. As long as she can tear up the ground, she can block any direct attacks, and since no one is stopping her, I guess that's allowed. I pray that you dodge this as well, Midoriya-san. Shizaki's vines split from one concentrated mass into a thorny swarm of serpents. Each vine picked up a smaller stone, and dozens of them were thrown at him from different directions. Oh, crap. Heat Blast muttered. At the last second, he intensified his own heat, creating a pressure wave that superheated and slowed down the stones, but it didn't stop them. Instinctively, he closed his eyes and raised his arms to shield himself from the impact, but it never came. When Heat Blast opened his eyes, he saw that the rocks, now glowing orange, were hovering mere inches away from him. Huh? He said, almost to himself. Diokinesis. I forgot about that. Interesting, Aizawa commented. It looks like Midoriya can use that form to control things that are affected by his heat. Rocks, at least. I guess you could say that his rock playlist is on fire, right? I hate you, and everything you stand for. Heat Blast grinned, and then pushed one hand forward. The stones flew right back at Shizaki 
who quickly turned around and plunged her vines back into the ground. They sprouted back up and formed a massive wall to block the stones. Heat Blast used the distraction to burn the rest of the wall to ashes. Shizaki was far from finished. Splitting her vines into two large bunches, she carved up two huge pieces of stone and brought them around to Heat Blast's sides. She slammed them together like a stone sandwich, with Heat Blast as the filling. At first, everyone thought that that was it a few people worried that Shizaki might have actually killed him but then the stone glowed, cracked, and exploded outward, leaving Heat Blast a little staggered, but otherwise unharmed. I'm lucky she hasn't tried to throw me out of the ring with a move like that, he thought. Even if I can block the rocks she throws at me, she's just going to keep it in until one of us makes a mistake. Okay, I know about her quirk now, but what else can I use? Her fighting style. She just sort of stands there and doesn't move. Struck by inspiration, Heat Blast shot a look at the ground until he found what he'd been hoping for. Hey, Shizaki Sam. He called out. One last chance to surrender. Shizaki still had her back to him. I respectfully decline. Then I'm really sorry. Shizaki turned her head so that she could see him with one eye. For what? This? Heat Blast pointed both hands at a hole in the ground the first hole Shizaki had created and shot out a wave of fire. The flame traveled down the tunnel, splitting off into the others Shizaki had made, and going to the origin of each. Heat Blast had kept his output low he didn't want to cause serious injury but he still flinched when he heard Shizaki's shriek of pain as the fire engulfed her. He stopped almost immediately, and started running before Shizaki finished collapsing to the ground. She was unconscious and covered in burns, none of them looked too serious, but they had to have been painful. Her gym uniform was charred, and her vines had been burned away almost to her scalp. Shizaki is unconscious. Midnight shouted. Midoriya wins. Midoriya felt sick as he turned back to normal. He wanted to win, sure, but he'd never wanted to hurt a fellow would-be hero. Instead of waving to the crowd to celebrate his victory, he followed the small robots that placed Shizaki on a stretcher and carried her out of the arena. He needed to apologize as soon as she woke up. Look at that sportsmanship, folks. Midoriya clearly has a good heart. Don't worry, everyone, our own recovery girl is on standby. Shizaki will be up and about soon enough. Speaking of soon, let's take a short break while Cementos repairs the ring. Way to go, Deku-kun. Uraraka shouted over the roar of the crowd. Did you guys see that? He was awesome. Hell yeah. Ashido gave the other girl a fist bump because of Uraraka's quirk. High fives were off the table. I was seriously worried when he got squished by those big rocks, but then he made them explode, and, and. Wow, I do feel bad for his opponent, though, Ida said. It was difficult to see from here, but I imagine that those burns were unpleasant. Hey, he's going with her to recovery girl, Ciro pointed out. That was pretty cool of him. Asui noticed that there were fewer people in the 1B section than before. I think he's going to have company soon, Ribbit. I can't say that I'm particularly happy that you caused these injuries, Recovery Girl said. However, it was kind of you to escort the young lady here. Midoriya nodded. He might have won the match, but he felt terrible for hurting Shizaki as badly as he had. Is she going to be okay? Recovery Girl huffed. Of course, boy, these burns aren't too serious. She leaned over and kissed Shizaki on the forehead. In seconds, the burns faded, and even the nubs of vine on her head looked more vibrant. She'll wake up soon, if I'm not here, tell her to rest and drink plenty of fluids. It'll help her skin and speed up the growth of her vines. Yes, ma'am. Midoriya turned back to Shizaki, only to spin right back around when the door slammed open. Recovery girl, is she okay? For a second, Midoriya thought that Kirishima's hair had gone gray, but then he recognized Tetsutetsu for who he was. He also recognized Kendo Itsuka, who was right behind him. She'll be fine. Recovery girl snapped and then rolled her eyes. Young people, always worrying I don't know how to do my job. While recovery girl fumed, the 1B students ran over to where Shizaki was sleeping. Midoriya stood and bowed. I'm all really sorry. He half shouted. I didn't mean to hurt her. I mean, I was T trying to win, but I didn't think I'd do this much damage. And, hey, it's okay, Kendo said gently, holding out her hand to make him stop. This kind of thing is why we all signed waivers when we started at UA, right? Amidoriya's mind went blank, until he remembered that he and his mother had signed just such a form amidst the stack of paperwork that came with attending UA. Right? Still, I'm so sorry. Hey, man, it's cool, Tetsutetsu said. Shizaki's tougher than she looks, I bet you anything that, by tomorrow, she'll look like nothing happened. Still, it's really manly of you to go with her to recovery girl. Between you and Kirishima, your class might not be so bad after all. Thanks, Midoriya just hoped that the good outweighed the bad also known as Bakugo and Maita. Ugh. The three students turned to see Shizaki sitting up, holding a hand to her head. 
That was unpleasant. She opened her eyes and saw her visitors. Oh, hello, everyone. I assume that I lost my match. Kendo sat next to her. Yeah, looks like I'm the only one from our class who's still in the fight. You um, Shizaki-san. Midoriya bowed again. I'm sorry for hurting you. Shizaki smiled kindly. It is fine, Midoriya-san. As you can see, I am doing better. Might I ask, did Recovery Girl say anything I should know about? Just to rest and drink fluids, Midoriya repeated. Wonderful. Shizaki accepted the cup of water Tetsu Tetsu got for her from the water cooler in the corner. Thank you, Tetsu Tetsu. Water and sunlight will help my vines grow back faster, Midoriya-san. So it might be beneficial to my health if I go back and watch Kendo in her match. Midoriya nodded, intrigued at that little tidbit about Shizaki's quirk. Still, he had done what he'd set out to do, and politely excused himself. Oh, Midoriya-san. Midoriya turned to see that Shizaki's smile had become a little more sincere. Thank you for coming here to see me, I appreciate it. And I will be cheering you on, unless you are facing Kendo. But I believe that will only happen if you both make it to the semifinals. Good luck to you. Midoriya left, but then Kendo was walking next to him in the hallway. My match is next, she explained. I don't suppose you've got any tips for facing Todoroki-san. Loyalty to his class made him hesitate, but then he thought back to how intense Todoroki had been lately. He's strong, he finally said. If you don't get in the first hit, you're going to lose. Kendo's eyes widened, and she nervously played with her side ponytail. Okay, so he's that strong. Good to know. Don't worry, I won't tell anyone that you gave me any kind of advice. I'd appreciate that. Midoriya shuddered at what Bekugo might do if he ever found out he'd helped someone inferior. Deku-kun. Iroraka practically leapt out of her seat to grab her friend in a hug. Congratulations, that was awesome. With her head tucked under his chin, Iroraka never saw Midoriya's face go red. Th thanks, Yuraraka. Ashido reached out and ruffled his hair. Yeah, you kicked ass out there. With her arms around him, Yuraraka could feel Midoriya's flinch. All right. Yuraraka let go and looked up at him in concern. Is something wrong, Deku-kun? Is Shizaki-san okay? Midoriya sat down amidst his friends. She's going to be fine, but I felt terrible about hurting her. Yuraraka felt like slapping herself. Midoriya was one of the kindest people she knew. Of course he would be upset by hurting someone who didn't have it coming. She wished she knew what to say to help him. Fortunately, Yeyorazu did. Midoriya, I'm sure that Shizaki-san would be more upset that you would let this stop you than the fact that she lost. Remember, the sports festival is about showing off what we can do. You know better than most that some heroes have to be particularly brutal when it comes to defeating powerful villains. Your match just proves that you are capable of doing so, but that you are also compassionate, even for someone you barely know. That's the kind of thing that shows that you'll be a great hero. Midoriya futilely wiped at the tears spilling down his face. Th thanks, yeah Momo, I needed to hear that. Iroraka smiled, but she couldn't help but feel a pang of jealousy. Yeah Yurazu always seemed to know what to say or do whenever Midoriya had a problem. It made Yuraraka feel useless. Still, as the next match was called, Yuraraka was shocked, embarrassed, and a little delighted when Midoriya leaned against her ever so slightly and rested the back of his hand against hers. Okay, this is nice, she thought. I guess Yamomo told him what he needed to hear to get out of that funk, but he needs this to keep him grounded. She almost laughed at the irony, and then turned her attention to the match. All right, folks, let's introduce our next combatants. From the Hero Courses Class 1B, it's the Kung Fu Girl with the Heavyweight Hands. The Ginger Grappler give it up for Kendo Itsuka. Kendo waved up at the crowd enthusiastically, even striking a confident pose as she walked. Even without ever speaking to her before, Yuraraka found herself liking the girl. And her opponent from Class 1A. He's got ice, he's got fire, but don't expect a song from this stoic student, it's Todoroki Shoto. Yuraraka cheered for her classmate, but next to her, she felt Midoriya tense up. She remembered how Todoroki had called him out before the sports festival began, and how he had pulled Midoriya aside after the second event, and wondered if that had anything to do with it. She couldn't help but frown. What was it with two of the strongest boys in her class making her friend so upset? In the ring, Todoroki curtly informed Midnight that he was ready. Kendo was more enthusiastic, but she never took her eyes off her opponent. To Yuraraka's inexperienced eye, it seemed that Kendo knew what she was doing. Midnight raised her whip and then brought it down. Begin. Almost before the word left Midnight's lips, Todoroki took a step forward with his right foot and turned half of the ring into an ice rink in two seconds. At first, Yuraraka thought that the ice would freeze Kendo's feet. But to her surprise, Kendo had jumped just in time. 
She then began skating across the ice. It wasn't perfect, and she had to expand her hands to nearly the size of her body to act as rudders, but she was able to get into Todoroki's face. She's only got one shot, Midoriya muttered. If she doesn't take him down here, she'll lose. Yuraka wondered how he knew that. Maybe Todoroki had told him that he wouldn't hold back for this part of the sports festival. More worryingly, maybe he hadn't, and Midoriya had somehow seen it. Either way, she would later replay what happened next several times on her phone to figure out the exact order of events. It started with Kendo bringing her right hand into Todoroki's shoulder, but just before it impacted, a blunt spike of ice sprouted up and hit her wrist. Kendo was surprised for less than half a second, but that was all Todoroki needed to grab her left hand with his right. A thin coat of ice covered Kendo's left side, but the enhanced strength of her enlarged hand started to crack it. Todoroki frowned, and then shifted his foot. In two seconds, an entire glacier was formed around Kendo, with only her head and some of her fingers still exposed. Yuraka leaned back, not just in shock, but because the ice from the glacier would have hit her if she hadn't. Most of her classmates had either ducked down, or were copying her. It took her a moment to realize that Midoriya had started to lean in front of her, his hand hovering over his watch. He was trying to protect me, she thought. From the way Midoriya was rapidly blinking and glancing around, he had reacted unconsciously. Is, is everyone okay? Midoriya asked. Yeyurazu put a hand on her chest as she tried to get her heart rate under control. I'm fine. So am I, Ribbit, Asui said with a shiver. Me, too, Ashido said, and then grabbed Yeyurazu's hand. Come on, Yamomo, let's go to our waiting rooms early. It's safer down there. I think everyone is well, Ida said, eyes scanning not just the rising stars, but also the rest of the class. Either Todoroki-san has exceptional control over his quirk, or we are all very lucky. In Yuraka's opinion, it was probably the latter. Further conversation ended when Midnight stepped off her podium, said something Yuraka couldn't hear, and then waved her whip. There you have it, folks. Present Mike announced, Kendo has surrendered. It might be too early to say so, but with power like that, I think Todoroki might be a shoe-in for the finals. He might even win the whole thing without breaking a sweat. Yuraka couldn't help but agree with him, off the top of her head, she could think of few heroes could put out the kind of power Todoroki had just exhibited, and Midoriya would have to face him if they both made it to the semifinals. She glanced at him worriedly, instead of looking nervous, however, he almost looked sad as Todoroki quickly thawed Kendo out of the ice. What is it you know that the rest of us don't? It took almost 20 minutes for the ice to get cleared away. By the time it was, Bakugo was more than ready for his match. He was just disappointed with who his opponent was. Out of everyone, I get sticky for round one. He thought bitterly. I couldn't get glasses, or ponytail, or icy hot. Shit, I couldn't even get Kirishima. The only opponent he didn't want for his first fight was Deku, ironically. He wanted the nerd to make it to the finals, just so he could crush him while getting the most attention. He was actually glad that Deku was in the other half of the brackets, because they could only meet in the finals. Finally, he received the go-ahead to make his way into the arena. After the introductions so far, he was a little curious to see how present Mike would hype him up. From Class 1A, it's the blonde bomber, the angry artillerist, the grand grenadier, give it up for Bakugo Katsuki. Heh, <laughs> not bad. Bakugo admitted quietly to himself as the crowd roared. And his opponent, also from Class 1A, he may have weird elbows, but don't underestimate him, or you'll be in a sticky situation. It's Siro Hanta. Across from Bakugo, Sticky stretched out his arms and grimaced. Yeah, take a shot at the elbows, nothing new there. Bakugo cracked his neck. Hey, Sticky, I've got a question. Yeah, what's up? You and Deku are tight, yeah. Bakugo glanced up at the stands and saw Deku watching nervously. The nerd had frog, glasses and round face close by and probably would have had the rest of his babysitters if they weren't getting ready for their match. I'd say we're friends, Sticky said ambivalently. Good. Bakugo grinned. I want to see Deku's reaction when I beat the crap out of you. Sticky's own smile never wavered. Good luck with that, dude. Are you boys ready? Midnight asked. She was giving Bakugo a warning look, not that he cared. All he had to do was tone it down enough that he didn't cripple or kill his opponent. I'm ready, Sticky said. Let's do this. Midnight gave Bakugo one more look, and then nodded. Begin. Bakugo aimed his palms behind him and let out a stream of explosions that sent him rocketing forward. Blast rush turbo. Sticky aimed one elbow and fired his tape, not at Bakugo, but the ground under him, and reeled himself forward at impressive speeds. Bakugo reached out with his right hand for a point-blank explosion, only for Sticky to shoot out another strand of tape at the last second and pulled himself to the right. 
that Hugo's explosion only sent his opponent staggering, but Sticky recovered and snagged his leg with more tape. With a heave, he yanked Bakugo to the ground, and if he hadn't cushioned the impact with a small explosion, it would have hurt a lot more than it did. Hey, look at that, Sticky teased. You do lead with your right. How the hell did he know Deku? Bakugo's eyes started to twitch. Of course he'd know something like that and share it with his weakling friends. Sticky shot out more tape, but Bakugo reached out and incinerated it with another explosion before it could get him. Okay, enough of this shit, he snarled and braced himself. Die. A huge explosion, bigger than anything he'd shown off at UA before, rocked the arena. It was so powerful that there was literally no way for Sticky to avoid enough of the blast, and when the smoke cleared, he was in a heap against a wall. His uniform was shredded and smoking, he was covered in burns, and he was clearly unconscious. Back Hugo grimaced and rubbed his wrist, using his super explosions without his gauntlets always hurt but they were the perfect trump card in a fight like this. Ciro is unconscious and out of bounds, Midnight declared. The winner is Bakugo. Unlike with his introduction, there were fewer cheers for his victory. Bakugo just sneered. If they were scared, that was their problem. He was about to leave, but Midnight stopped him. I'm giving you a warning now, she said. If you pull a stunt like that again and put a student's life at risk, not only will I disqualify you, but your future in UA will be reconsidered. Is that understood? Beck Hugo used every ounce of self-control not to scowl at her. Understood, Midnight Sensei. What is it with this school? He thought as he walked away. I won, and I proved that I'm strong. Isn't that what being a hero is all about? That's what All Might does all the time, right? Ashido nervously bounced from one foot to the other. She wasn't just nervous about her match, Yeyarazu was easily one of the best students in class, but because she'd heard present Mike going on about how Siro was quickly being taken to the infirmary. As soon as her own match was over, she would head over there and see how he was doing. Strangely, the idea of going out to fight Yeyarazu was a bit comforting. It took her mind off of Siro. Some of the others will be there with him, she told herself. Sue definitely will, Midori and Achako, too. Tenyu will probably stay in the stands to let everyone know how the match goes. Yeah, that sounds like him. She looked up and saw the light signaling her to head out. Okay, looks like it's my turn. I hope present Mike rings me in with something cool. With the biggest smile she could muster, Ashido jogged out into the arena, which had been repaired after Bakugo's short rampage. From Class 1A, it's the girl with acid for blood and horns that make no sense. The pink partier, the acidic ace give it up for Ashido Mina. Ashido waved and blew kisses to the crowd, she loved putting on a show. Out of the corner of her eye, she saw Ida in the stands with about half of the class, but the rest of her friends were absent. She giggled when he gave her two thumbs up. Yep, called it. And her opponent, the class president of 1A. She's got looks, she's got smarts, and she's got a quirk that'll knock your socks off. It's the brainy beauty, the classy creator. Give a big hand for Yeyarazu Momo. Ashido grinned as her friend stepped into view. And I thought I liked showing off. Nice look, Ye Momo. Yeyarazu ignored the catcalls from the audience. She had rolled up her sleeves and unzipped her top, revealing a black sports bra. She had also taken a page out of Ida's book and rolled up her pants to just above the knees. That was enough to tell Ashido that she was serious, with that much skin exposed. Yeyarazu had plenty of places she could use her quirk. Just know that I respect you enough as an opponent, and as a friend, to take this seriously, Yeyarazu said, though she didn't hide the small smile. Okay, ladies, are you ready? Midnight asked. Yes, Midnight Sensei. Both girls said it once. All right, begin. Ashido made the first move, skating across the ring and leaving a trail of acid in her wake. Her goal was to get in close, melt anything Yeyarazu threw at her, and wear her down until she ran out of lipids. At first, her plan seemed to work. Yeyarazu created a long pole from her arm and tried to clothesline her. Ashido just coated her arms with acid and melted through it. Yeyarazu then made a rectangular shield with the same arm and did her best to keep it between her and Ashido. Come on, Yamomo, Ashido taunted, you can do better than that. The only warning Ashido had was a smirk on her opponent's face, and then the shield flew off her arm and rocketed literally, with four small rockets mounted to the corners straight at her. Ashido was so surprised that she couldn't react in time. The shield clipped her shoulder and sent her spinning. Okay, oh, Ashido whined. What the heck was that? Rocket fuel, Yeyarazu said. I'm sure you can figure out the rest. Ashido's jaw dropped. You can make rocket fuel. Much more than that. With her other arm, the one she'd kept hidden with her shield until now, Yeyarazu hurled a triple-weighted bolus at her. 
Ashido flipped gracefully into the air to avoid it, but for a moment, she had no way to maneuver. Yeyorazu took that moment to aim her palm at Ashido's face, and a long pole extended out. Ashido normally used her acid on her arms and feet, but that didn't mean she couldn't generate it elsewhere. Highly corrosive acid dripped from her forehead in a thick bubble, melting the pole before it hit her. Unfortunately, it was risky to use acid that potent around her face, and as soon as she landed on the ground, she wiped the acid off before it dripped into her eyes. Okay, so I avoided a concussion, but now I have an acid burn on my forehead. Ouch. Yeyorazu wasn't done, she pulled a large, weighted net from her stomach and hurled it at Ishido while she was distracted. You haven't learned it all, smart girl, Ashido called out, and swiped her arms downwards and across each other. Acid X. The X-shaped wave of acid splashed against the net, but to Ashido's surprise, it only hissed a little as it fell over her. Sorry, Yeyorazu said. I've been coating my creations with stronger and stronger bases, trying to counteract your acid. It seems that I figured it out. Ashido frowned and started creating her more corrosive acid, but then Yeyorazu strode up to her and created a large hammer. By the time you melt through that, I'll have brought this down on your head. I suggest you surrender, I don't want to give you a concussion. Ashido considered fighting on. She could call Yeyorazu's bluff, but the girl had calculated every move to get to this point, and something told her that there were backup plans in case she couldn't force a surrender. A small, petty part of her wanted to go for it anyway, just to make it harder for Yeyorazu in the next match. She viciously quashed that part of her. Just because she wanted to win didn't mean she was the type of person to sabotage a friend. I surrender, she declared. Midnight raised her whip. Ashido has forfeited. Yeyorazu is the winner. The crowd cheered, and Yeyorazu helped get the net off of Ashido, taking care not to touch the acid-coated parts. Good match, Yeyorazu said kindly. This probably would have ended differently if I hadn't had time to prepare. Thanks, Yamomo. Ashido smiled, even if it was a little forced. Come on, let's go check in on Siro. When Siro woke up, it took him a minute to figure out what had happened. Oh, right. I fought Bekugo. Kinda figured I'd be in the infirmary, but still. Oh, at least he wasn't alone. As soon as his eyes had opened, his vision was filled with the faces of his friends. He tried to sit up, only for Ida and Midoriya to gently push him back down onto the cot. Recovery girl said not to move, Midoriya explained, but his voice sounded weird, like it was underwater. What's? Siro coughed and winced when the half-healed burns on his face were pulled. Why does everything sound weird? Midoriya flinched, which was a bad sign. W well, your eardrums were blown out. Recovery girl says that you'll be fine in a few hours, but you can't take the bandages off your ears until then. You, um, you also. When Midoriya trailed off, Siro turned to Asui for a straight answer. You're going to have a scar, ribbit. Siro grimaced. Is it bad? Yeyorazu created a small mirror from her hand and held it up. It's on the left side of your jaw. Sure enough, there was a jagged scar, just in front of his ear, that ran a couple of inches up. It looked like it had happened a few weeks ago, not that day, he had recovery girl to thank for that. Anything else I need to worry about? He asked as calmly as he could. Uraraka shook her head. You had some fractures, but recovery girl healed those. You just need to take it easy for a few days for the burns. Siro thought about it, considering who he'd been fighting, it could have been a lot worse. How about you guys? Did I miss anything? Ashido raised a hand. I lost to Yamomo, so out of the seven of us, only she, Midori and Ida are moving on. And Yamomo and Ida are fighting next round. Siro said he felt a little better knowing his mind wasn't so rattled that he couldn't remember that. So only two of us can make it to the semifinals. Midoriya nodded, but he looked miserable. Siro, I'm really sorry. I should have told you more about the way Bakugo fights, or ways to avoid his quirk. Dude, relax, Siro interrupted. Maybe I could have done better if there had been some terrain for me to use, but we were on a flat, open space. Honestly, I was lucky I got in any hits. Don't blame yourself, man. Midoriya looked like he was going to argue, but then Uraraka put a hand on his shoulder and gently tugged him away. Come on, Deku-kun, you need to get ready for your next match. All right. Siro managed to hold in his laughter until the two were gone, even though it hurt when he let it out. Oh, man, that's adorable. Ashido grinned. I know, right. Asui still looked upset by her standards, at least. Siro, are you really okay, Ribbit? Not just physically. Eh, hey, I can admit that I'm not a pure combat type like Bakugo, so I was at a disadvantage. Siro smirked. Besides, somewhere in Bakugo's mind, he knows that he got to this round because of me and Ashido, and that's gonna drive him crazy. He slowly stretched. Hey, when did Recovery Girl say I could leave? Not for at least an hour, Yeyorazu said. 
so you'll probably miss the next round of fights. But if you're lucky, you should be able to watch the semifinals. Cool. Siro settled into the cot and closed his eyes. I'm just gonna rest, okay? Can you guys let me know how the matches go? He suddenly winced, and his eyes opened again. Wait, no, one of the fights is between Yamomo and Iida. Hang on, I said that already, sorry, I guess I'm still a little out of it. Well, good luck to both of you. Thank you, Siro, Ida said, and headed for the door. Yamomo, we should prepare for our match, right? Yeyorazu smiled at them. We'll do our best, everyone. Ashido jumped up. I'll head back to the stands and cheer for Midori. You coming, Tsu? Asui hesitated, then shook her head. I'll stay here with Siro, Ribbit. Can you tell me what happens after the fights? Sure, make me run back and forth every ten minutes. Ashido pretended to pout, but only for a second. No worries, guys, see you later. Soon, it was just Asui and Siro in the infirmary, the latter yawned, but then smiled. Thanks for sticking around, Tsu. No problem. Asui waited for Siro to close his eyes, and then leaned in close to whisper in his ear. Ribbit. Siro's eyes snapped open. Damn it. Welcome back, everyone. Present Mike waited for the roaring crowd to calm down before continuing. I hope you all enjoyed that short break, because we're ready to start our next match. It's about time, Aizawa grumbled. First up, let's hear it for our dark horse from General Studies. He may look as tired as a racer head, but he's got a quirk that'll have even pro heroes quaking in their boots. Give it up for Shinso Hitoshi. The crowd cheered as Shinso walked into the ring. He did a good job of keeping his features neutral, but he failed to completely hide his proud smirk. And his opponent, the boy with more surprises than Christmas morning, it's Class 1A's Midoriya Izuku. He may be the front runner for the first year events, but can even Midoriya stand against Shinso's quirk? Let's find out. Hey, Shinso said as Midoriya approached, no hard feelings, right? While the match hadn't started, Midoriya wasn't about to respond, just in case. Instead, he locked his jaw and nodded, while his hand hovered over the activated Ultimatrix. Are both combatants ready? Midnight waited for both boys to nod. All right, begin. Round two, begin. Midoriya slammed his hand down on the dial as quickly as he could. He hoped that his idea worked, because if not, Shinso would probably be able to take over his mind. He was honest enough to know that he probably wouldn't be able to stop himself from responding to one of Shinso's questions. Well, that's a strange one, Shinso said as the green light faded. What do you call that form? Wildma responded with a combination of growls and barks. Shinso frowned when Wildma didn't go slack. His quirk, brainwashing, hadn't taken effect. Oh, cool. Iroraka pointed at her friend in the arena. I know that one. That was the first form Deku-kun showed me. He tried digging me out of some debris when I got trapped during the entrance exam. Really? Ashido peered down at Wildmutt. Weird. All of his other forms had a basic human shape, except for the flying one from earlier. It is fortunate he has such a form, Ida said. It appears to make him immune to Shinso-san's quirk. Yeah, that's pretty cool, Ashido admitted. Looks like he'll have an easier time of it than last round. Hey, it looks like Midoriya isn't reacting like Shinso's last opponent, present Mike commented. Any idea why, my favorite co-host? It might be that Midoriya can't respond normally in that form, which means that he can't trigger Shinso's quirk. And I'm your only co-host, I'm your favorite by default. While Mud ignored the commentary and charged at Shinso, who tried to dive to the side and only partially succeeded. A large paw still managed to catch his leg and sent him tumbling. The boy struggled to his feet, he was trembling, but it wasn't from fear or pain. Of course you'd have a form that can resist my ability, he snapped. That's just how it is with you hero course people, isn't it? The rest of us, we try and we try. But no matter how hard we push ourselves, you can do in days what takes us months. How does it feel to be so lucky, huh? Why do you get to excel when I can't even get noticed? Wild Mutt growled and whined his answer he was annoyed that Shinso had no idea that he did know what he was going through. For most of his life, he had dealt with people, even those with the most mundane of quirks, looking down on him for having nothing at all. At least Shinso had a quirk, and a powerful one at that, until he found the Ultimatrix. He had been seen as less than useless. He had known that Shinso would be able to get under his skin which was why he'd chosen Wildmutt to begin with but now he had to win as quickly as possible, because he had a few things to say. With a roar, Wildmutt charged and grabbed Shinso by the arm. He heaved the boy around and hurled him out of the ring. Shinso has been knocked out of bounds. Midnight pointed at Midoriya, who had turned back to normal. Midoriya wins. And there you have it, folks. Present Mike cried out. Our first semifinalist is Midoriya Izuku. Show him some love. 
The crowd erupted into cheers, but Midoriya didn't pay it any attention. Instead, he walked over to Shinso. Now that we're not fighting, can I say something? Shinso scoffed and looked away. Sure, I can't really stop you, right? Get over yourself, Midoriya said. His words were simple, but the iron in his voice made Shinso freeze. You think I'm lucky? Yeah, I have a lot of power, but I spent most of my life thinking I was quirkless. You might think you had it rough, but at least you weren't labeled as worthless by everyone you met. He reached out and hauled Shinso to his feet. You have an amazing quirk, and the only reason you're not in the hero course is because the entrance exam was a bad matchup for you. Shinso didn't reply right away. Instead, he just stared at Midoriya with wide eyes. Midoriya wilted under his gaze and looked away. Th that's what I think, anyway. Shinso stared at him with wide eyes. Why are you so weird? Sorry, I as soon as the words left his mouth, Midoriya froze up, trapped by Shinso's quirk. Let's walk out of the ring already, Shinso commanded, and Midoriya's body unwillingly followed. Once they were out of sight, he poked Midoriya in the shoulder hard enough to jolt him free of his quirk. There, you were being embarrassing, and I just saved us from all of that. Uh, anyway, I'm gonna head back to my class. Shinso turned and waved tiredly, not even looking at Midoriya. Wait. Shinso paused and turned back. Look, a lot of people saw you in action in your fight against Suyu, and I'm the vice president of my class. Maybe I can talk to Aizawa-sensei and get him to give you another test to get into the hero course. Shinso couldn't completely hide the hope in his eyes, but then he looked away. You think Yue will let someone with a villain's quirk become a hero? This time, Midoriya gave him a flat stare that would have made Asui proud. Half of my transformations make me look like horrible monsters. If they let me in, I'm sure they'll give you a chance. He brightened up as an idea struck him. And your quirk doesn't have to be seen as villainous. You could end hostage situations in seconds or stop rioting. All kinds of things that could end a crisis peacefully. Midoriya began muttering to himself at that point, to make Shinso even more confused. The boy had taken out a notebook and was furiously scribbling in it. Where was he even hiding that thing? Shinso wondered. All right, all right, he said, I get it. Look, if you really want to give me a recommendation thanks, I guess. Midoriya smiled brightly. Of course. Shinso nodded. Anyway, we should head back to our classes. I have some stuff to think about. See you around, maybe. Yeah, Midoriya said as Shinso left, see you around. That was nice of you, Ben commented. You didn't have to do any of that. I bet he got noticed after his first fight. It couldn't hurt, Midoriya said, once he was sure Shinso was too far away to hear him. And I think he just wanted to hear someone say he didn't have a villain's quirk. I know I needed someone to say I could be a hero. You're welcome, Ben said as they began walking. By the way, you said there was something you wanted to talk about, back when you finished the obstacle course. What was it? Midoriya shrugged. Just something I wanted to run by you. You're always telling me that I can turn from one alien to another like it's no big deal. And? Well what if I don't have a chance to switch? What if things are going so fast that I don't have time to even think about transforming again? Where are you going with this? You saw how I've only used one alien for every round. Ben paused. Wait did you give yourself a handicap? Midoriya nodded. It's like Nezu-sensei was talking about during the weekend training. Just because I can swap on the fly doesn't mean I should rely on it. I've been planning out which alien I should use. Dang, I'm impressed. Ben shook his head. My programming makes me assume that you'll be as immature as the real Ben was, but you keep surprising me. Thanks. You're still as impulsive as he was, though, Ben said with a grin. Fighting the big robot at the entrance exam. The USJ fight I think he'd be proud. Midoriya couldn't keep the grin off his face, which was mirrored by his friends when he rejoined them. Midori, that was so cool. Ashido said as she stood up. You totally own that fight. Hey, I'm gonna let Suyu and Siro know what happened. Be right back. Yuraka handed him a bottle of water. Hey, Deku-kun, what was that dog form called, anyway? And how do you know what you're doing without eyes? Wildmutt, Midoriya supplied automatically. And I mostly use my sense of smell and hearing but I also kind of have an echolocation ability. Yeyorazu tilted her head, and since you couldn't talk in that form, you were immune to Shinso-san's quirk. Midoriya nodded. It was the only thing I could think of, but I wasn't sure if it would work. Some of the stuff he said I did respond to him, it just wasn't in words. Then it's a good thing that it worked, Ida said, and then stood up. Yeah Momo, our match will be starting soon. We should head to the waiting rooms. Of course, Yeyorazu stood up. Please tell us what happens during the next match. We will. Midoriya promised. Good luck to both of you. Yuraka added. 
The next match had the audience buzzing with anticipation before present Mike started his introductions. Both Todoroki and Takoyami had displayed incredible quirks, and everyone was eager to see how they stacked up against each other. Welcome back, folks. Let's not waste any time and bring in our competitors. Both are from Class 1A, and both are as stoic as they come. Let's see who cracks under the pressure. First up, give a big hand for the boy with the living shadow, the avian avenger, Takoyami Fumikage. Takoyami stood with his eyes closed and his arms crossed. If anything, he almost looked like he was meditating right before his match. And his opponent, the only thing that can pierce his eyes is his steely personality. He's an environmentalist's worst nightmare, climate change personified. It's Todoroki Shoto. Todoroki had the slightest slouch to his posture, if not for the determined look in his eye. One might be forgiven for thinking that he wanted to just give up. Are both fighters ready? Midnight asked. Wait, Takoyami has a passenger. Does both apply here? Takoyami opened his eyes. We are ready, Midnight Sensei. I'm ready, Todoroki said. Midnight shrugged. I'll think about the semantics later. Begin. Like with his first fight, Todoroki attempted to end it by freezing Takoyami in place. Rather than try to avoid it, Dark Shadow lashed out and smashed the ice before it reached his partner's feet. Nice try. Dark Shadow taunted. But you'll have to do better than that. Todoroki narrowed his mismatched eyes and stomped with his right side. A much larger wave of ice swept forward in an overhead blow. Takoyami ran in a wide arc, trying to stick to Todoroki's left side. When the ice got close, Dark Shadow smashed it aside. He was about to lunge at Todoroki when it happened a chunk of ice reflected a beam of sunlight directly into the living quirk. For anyone else, it would have only been a minor inconvenience if the light had gone into their eyes. But for Dark Shadow, it caused him to practically wither in midair. Dark Shadow, now shrunk to the size of a large dog, looked up at Todoroki pitifully. I don't suppose we could talk this out. No. Still, Todoroki took pity on the nearly powerless Quirk and his partner and gently coated both of them in ice. Takoyami is unable to continue. Midnight shouted and then paused. And neither is Dark Shadow. Thanks for the mention, Dark Shadow whimpered. Todoroki wins. And with an overwhelming victory, Todoroki has become our second semifinalist. He'll be going up against Midoriya in the next round, and I know that that'll be a fight no one wants to miss. The crowd erupted with applause, impressed with Todoroki's win. While he hadn't used the same insane level of power as before, he had still won handily. Sorry, he said quietly as he used his fire to free Takoyami in Dark Shadow. There is nothing to apologize for, Takoyami said with a bow. You won fairly. I wish you well in your next bout. What he said, Dark Shadow said tiredly as he withdrew back into Takoyami. If I may offer some advice, Todoroki-san. Takoyami waited until Todoroki nodded before he continued. Whatever darkness weighs down on your spirit is clearly crushing you. I will not pretend to know what that darkness is, but you must either cast it aside or learn to live with it. If you do neither, it will destroy you. Todoroki just turned and walked away, heading back to his waiting room. He wanted to spend some time to himself to get centered before his next fight anything to get away from Takoyami's words because they hit closer to home than he was willing to admit. Of course, things only got worse halfway to his destination, when he nearly ran into his father, Todoroki Enji. Endeavor was a giant of a man, nearly of the same size and physique as All Might. His dark blue bodysuit was lit up by fiery lines, and his face was covered in his hellfire. He looked down at his son, arms crossed and eyes narrowed. Shoto, he rumbled. Endeavor, his son replied evenly. You've won your first two matches. Excellent. Endeavor looked anything but pleased, however. I understand why you didn't use your flames in your first match. That girl was nothing compared to you. But you got lucky when your opponent's weakness came into play in this match. If you had used your flames, it would have ended everything in an instant. Why should I use your power? Shoto stepped around Endeavor and continued walking. I'm doing just fine without it. All you're doing is holding yourself back. Endeavor said evenly, though he raised his voice to be heard. If you want to be a hero even greater than All Might, then you should embrace the quirk I gave you. I don't need your quirk, the younger Todoroki thought fiercely. I'll win without it. I'll show you that I can be a great hero, the greatest, with only mom's power. Maybe then, she'll know that she doesn't have to hate me. Hey, Takoyami-san. Hiroaka waved the boy over as he rejoined Class 1A. Sorry about your match, but you still did great. Takoyami nodded and sat near her in Midoriya. Thank you. I am pleased that I made it as far as I did. I knew that I would have more trouble the further I got into the sports festival. Midoriya frowned at that, but then glanced up at the mid-morning sun. Oh, because dark shadow gets weaker when there's more light out. Exactly, and there were no shadows for me to empower dark shadow with. Is he gonna be okay? 
Uraraka asked. Takoyami smirked. Do not worry. He only needs a short rest. Thanks for the concern, Dark Shadow said, only poking his face out of Takoyami's chest. Midoriya-san, do you have a plan for when you face Todoroki-san in the next match? With his avian features, it was almost impossible to get a read on what Takoyami was thinking. But Midoriya thought he looked genuinely interested in what he had to say. He didn't notice it, but most of his class was interested in his answer as well. Everyone knew that that fight would probably be the highlight of the first year event. W well, I have a few ideas, Midoriya said. I'm pretty sure I know what Todoroki-san expects me to use, but I can work around that. Besides, he thought, I want to get through to him. I can't do that if I pick an alien he has no chance of beating. I need to think like Shinso-san, I need to get him talking. The more he thought about it, the fewer options he had. Some of his aliens were just bad matchups for Todoroki. They would either lose, or would win too fast for Midoriya to get his point across. Good luck, Midoriya-san, Takoyami said. You are going to need it. Yeyorazu calmly stretched as she waited for her next round. Ida was going to be a tricky opponent, but she had been giving it plenty of thought. Ideally, she would have created traps to slow him down so that she could beat him. But with the gladiator style of this event, she had no such opportunity. What she did have was arguably her greatest asset her mind. While she didn't have quite the tactical acumen that Midoriya possessed, she could still make a workable plan. And with the time she'd been given, she had just that. All she had to do was avoid getting defeated by Ida's opening blitz attack, which she was almost certain he'd use. As much as she hated fighting her friends, she was also glad. She had come to know not only how their quirks operated, but also how they thought. That gave her plenty of time to come up with the best plans to defeat them in this tournament. Ashido had been too confident in the corrosive power of her acid, and tended to leave herself open with her acrobatics. Ida was too straightforward to do anything but charge, and he was too honest to try anything underhanded. And so, she had her plan. It was almost too simple, but Yeirazu's quirk had taught her a valuable lesson on life the fewer moving parts, the less that can go wrong. When the light signaled for her to enter the arena, she did so with all the confidence she could muster. The crowd cheered, but she noticed that there were fewer catcalls this time. Maybe she had proven herself more than a pretty face in the last round. Entering from stage left is the class president of class 1A. She not only has the smarts to figure out how to beat you, she can create anything she needs to make it happen. Give it up for Yeyorazu Momo. Yeyorazu saw her classmates waving at her, and she smiled, even Mainto was being respectful. Though whether or not it had anything to do with Sato keeping a firm grip on the back of his neck was up for debate. And her opponent is the knight who doesn't need a horse to charge into battle. Blink and you'll miss him, it's Ida Tenya. I wish that we had fought later on in the sports festival, Yamomo, Ida said as he bowed. However, I have no intention of losing here. Yeyorazu nodded. I feel the same way, Ida. Still, no matter if you win or lose, I promise to give you a more dignified match than your last. Midnight hit her smile behind one hand at the reminder. Are both fighters ready? Yes, both students said, and then smiled at each other. Very well begin. Ida immediately leaned forward, and his engines roared. Recipro burst. Just what I was hoping for. Yeyorazu had calculated Ida's speed during the cavalry battle, factoring in the estimated weight of the rest of the team, and had a good idea of what he could do when not pushing three other people. With that in mind, she had exactly 1.8 seconds to carry out her plan. Her stomach glowed as she created a sturdy piece of sheet metal, and then she fell onto her back. She held up the metal at an angle with her hands and knees, moving at such high speeds. Ida didn't have the space necessary to avoid the makeshift ramp, and was catapulted through the air. I have less than two seconds before he hits the ground. A bolas was created from her arm as she scrambled to her feet. She hurled it at Ida's legs, she had hoped to catch both his ankles, but ended up only snaring one foot. Still, the sudden change in weight caused him to land awkwardly, and he spent precious moments trying to free himself. Three seconds before he gets free, Yeyorazu concentrated hard and created a length of thick chain from her stomach. With a yell of effort, she swung it horizontally to wrap around Ada's torso, even as she kept creating the object. With a grunt of effort that came with making something with so much mass, she dropped the navel anchor to the ground. Ida was strong, but there was no way he could drag something that heavy. You've miscalculated, Yamomo, Ida said, even though it took him some effort to stand tall. My legs are still free, and I have one last trick to play. Jets of blue flame burst from his engines. Recipro extend. Yeyorazu couldn't believe it as Ida not only began to drag the anchor, he was moving almost as fast as he would with an unencumbered Recipro burst. She had thought that he would be tangled up enough to get in close and finish him off, but now, he's still moving in a straight line. 
I have a chance. She fell onto her back once again, tucked in her legs, and aimed her feet at her rapidly approaching friend. Her pants became shorts as two enormous springs burst forth around her legs. Unbalanced and unable to slow down in time, Ida crashed headlong into her improvised defense. The springs tightened, and then pushed back, Ida was sent flying backwards, and there was a loud clang as his head connected with the anchor behind him. Yayarazu panted heavily as she kicked away the springs and forced herself up. Creating all that metal had almost completely exhausted her lipids, and her last move had definitely torn a few muscles in her legs. She staggered over to Ida, who was barely conscious. She fell to one knee and drew back her fist, which was soon enhanced by a set of brass knuckles. At this point, there's no way you can free yourself or fight back before my fist hits your temple, she said tiredly. Surrender or be knocked out. For a moment, it looked like Ida would continue to struggle, then... He closed his eyes. I surrender. Midoriya and Yuraka were in the odd position of feeling good and bad at the same time. They were happy that Yeyurazu would be moving on, but they felt bad for Ida, who wasn't. Ida has surrendered. Midnight declared. The winner is Yeyurazu. For her part, Yeyurazu could only wave tiredly at the crowd that was going ballistic at her victory. She then allowed the medical robots to carry her to Recovery Girl, along with Ida. Poor Ida, Yuraka said. He was so close. Midoriya nodded. Yamomo had a really good strategy, but if Ida had connected with that last charge, he probably would have won. Ashido grimaced. I'll go see if they're both okay, and then I'll be right back. You stay here, Midori. She waved her finger at him when he stood up. You need to focus on your next match. Yuraraka, if he tries to be all noble, make him weightless so that he can't go anywhere. You got it. Yuraraka's smile was teasing, but she still held four fingers against Midoriya's back. Midoriya wanted to protest, but then Ben was standing in front of him. Dude, relax, they'll all be fine. I'm pretty sure Recovery Girl knows what she's doing. Fine, Midoriya sighed, I'll stay put. Good. Ashido dashed off. I'll be back soon. For all that he had encouraged his friends who had not done as well as him, Ida still felt bad for not doing better. He felt like he had let his family down, he felt like he had let Tensei down. Hold still, dearie, Recovery Girl said, and planted a kiss on his forehead. In seconds, the bruises and headache were gone, but he was tired. On the other side of the infirmary, Yeyurazu was massaging her sore legs, but she looked at him apprehensively. Tenya there are no hard feelings, right? Hida immediately sat upright and chopped the air as he spoke. Of course not, Yamomo. Regardless of how our battle ended, I still consider you a good friend who will go on to be an amazing hero. Yeyurazu blushed a little, but then jumped when Ida started vibrating wildly. What the? Ah, forgive me. Ida pulled out his phone, which he had snagged on his way to the infirmary. I am getting a call. Please excuse me. While Ida left to speak in private, Asui and Siro smiled at their friend. She frowned at them. What? Nice blush there, Yamomo, Siro teased. Should have figured Ida was your kinda guy. Yeyurazu's expression was stern, but it was ruined by her reddening cheeks. For your information, I do not see him in that way. Just be glad we're not Mina, Ribbit, Asui said. She somehow managed to sound gleeful without changing her usual tone. Don't worry, we won't tell her if you don't want us to, but we'll remember this. Yeyurazu sighed, just as Ashido burst into the infirmary to check on everyone. She supposed that, if this was the price for moving on to the next round, she would have to pay it. Hello, mother, Tenya said, once he found an empty waiting room. I assume you saw what happened in the sports festival. I'm sorry that I couldn't make it to at least the semifinals, but... Tenya, please listen to me, the Ida matriarch said, with enough panic behind her voice to immediately alarm her youngest son. I'm sorry that you lost, but right now, you need to know something. Mother, what's happened? It's your brother. Tenya's mother paused, and he realized that she was crying. He was in Hasu City, and he was attacked by a villain. He's in the hospital right now. For Tenya, it was as if the world had stopped spinning, and he lost all feeling in his body. Tensei, his beloved older brother, Ingenium, had been hurt by a villain. His mind literally couldn't comprehend it for several long moments. His response, when it came, was almost frighteningly emotionless. Mother, where is Tensei now? I'm, I'm sending your father to pick you up right now. He's close to the stadium, and he'll take you to the hospital. Do you know Tensei's current condition? He was taken to the ICU, that's all I know. I'm sorry this is happening to you, but there is no need to apologize, mother. Ida glanced up and saw Yeyurazu walk by, but with the door closed, she hadn't heard anything. I will be waiting for father, I just wish to let one of my friends know that I will not be there. Of course, see you soon, Tenya. I love you. I love you too, mother. Ida hung up and walked back to the infirmary. There was one friend he had that both could handle what he had to say maturely 
and wouldn't be distracted from the sports festival by his news. Excuse me, Suyu, may I speak to you alone? Asui and Siro shared a look, but the latter shrugged. Go ahead, recovery girl should be giving me the all clear to head back to the stands in a few minutes. Asui nodded and followed Ida outside the infirmary. What's going on, Ribbit? Suyu, I am about to tell you something in confidence, Ida said, more robotically than usual. Please do not tell anyone else, I will do so when I have more information. He waited until Asui nodded. I will be leaving immediately. My brother was attacked by a villain and has been taken to the hospital. I am sorry to miss. Before he could finish, Asui grabbed him in a brief but tight hug and then stepped back and pointed to the exit. Go. Just go, now. I'll handle it from here. Dimly, Ida remembered that Asui had siblings of her own. If anyone could understand, it was her. He nodded and then ran for the exit. He had to see his brother. Tensei, please be all right. Hiroshima was pumped for his fight. Though that was no surprise, you didn't have to know him for longer than a few minutes to know that he was pumped up for most things. As long as he got a chance to show how manly he was, he was content. Even failing didn't faze him for long. After all, it was a chance for him to grow and become even manlier. There was only one thing that dampened his excitement for his upcoming fight his opponent. He knew he could win, that wasn't what bothered him. No, what bothered him was how vicious Bakugo had been in his first fight. Ciro hadn't deserved the kind of punishment Bakugo had tossed out, and it was just one more blow to the already wobbly tower of support Kirishima was trying to hold up. Bakugo had some of the best qualities going for him he was smart, talented, had an amazing quirk, and an aura of confidence that many people could easily latch onto. Kirishima could admit that he was one of those people. However, his major drawback was that he was a jerk. Not the angsty kind of jerk, the kind that had deep thoughts on his mind and didn't like being disturbed Todoroki and Takoyami came to mind there but the kind that intentionally used his words to hurt people. Kirishima was never bothered by that kind of thing. But other people's skin wasn't as thick as his, both literally and figuratively. He wasn't stupid, he hadn't missed the way Midoriya never made eye contact with Bakugo, or how he did his best to stay on the opposite side of whatever room they might share. Midoriya had even said that he and Bakugo had some bad history between them on the second day of class, and everyone saw how Midoriya's circle of friends put themselves between him and Bakugo whenever they could. Bakugo had bullied Midoriya. Hiroshima couldn't say how bad it was, but it was enough that Midoriya as powerful as he was now was afraid of Bakugo. That was why Kirishima needed to fight Bakugo here, to make him fight as hard as possible. In Kirishima's mind, if Bakugo took out more of his aggression on someone who wasn't bothered by hurtful words, he'd have nothing in his arsenal for Midoriya. Then, maybe, Bakugo would think about his actions. My quirk is not just armor for myself, but a shield for others. I want to be a hero who keeps people safe, and I can't do that if I break. Even if I fall, I will not break. His resolve strengthened, Kirishima walked into the arena. All right, folks, now we have a battle of the unstoppable force against the immovable object. In one corner, it's the immovable object, the boy with the heart of gold, skin of stone, and manly spirit. It's Kirishima Ijiro. The crowd went wild, and Kirishima waved, especially when he saw his classmates cheering. He managed not to look embarrassed when Ashido started playfully blowing kisses his way and his opponent, the unstoppable force. He's got a temper to match the quirk of his, so Kirishima better watch out. He's the rampaging rocketeer, diabolical destroyer, it's Bakugo Katsuki. Bakugo's applause was more restrained than Kirishima's, but he didn't seem to care that much. He had a laser focus on Kirishima, as if he expected the fight to start before Midnight said anything. Okay, boys, I want a clean fight, Midnight said. Try not to kill each other, all right. Kirishima grinned with his shark-like teeth. Yes, ma'am. Sure, whatever. Midnight raised an eyebrow at Bakugo's reply, but not at all the same. She raised her whip and then brought it down. Begin. Kirishima didn't usually use his full body hardening. It took too much effort and didn't last very long. Instead, he tried to figure out where his opponent would strike and harden that particular body part. That usually left his enemy open for a hardened punch, kick, or even headbutt. Unfortunately, Bakugo's quirk didn't play like that, and if Kirishima didn't want to lose in the first three seconds, he had to go all out from the beginning. His body stiffened and creaked, until even his eyes were as hard as stone. Come on, Bakugo. Kirishima roared. Let's do this. Bakugo grinned wildly. Whatever you say, idiot. The first explosions didn't even slow Kirishima down, not that he expected them to. His hardening was strongest at the beginning, and while he wasn't a quirk enthusiast like Midoriya, he knew that Bakugo's quirk got more powerful as fights went on. 
not less. With that in mind, Hiroshima charged through the blast to get in Bakugo's face. Only a last-second explosion that sent Bakugo flying upwards saved him from getting a hardened haymaker to the face. Instead, Hiroshima caught his ankle, and the blow sent him careening off course. Shit. Bakugo rolled to his feet. Not bad, Kirishima. I kind of expected you to just stand there and take it. Kirishima grinned as his blood sang. What kind of man would I be if I didn't dish it right back? Besides, I knew you could take it. He ran forward and threw a jab that Bakugo dodged. And I figured you'd want to fight someone who can fight back. Now, Bakugo's smile vanished as he peppered Kirishima with smaller explosions. What the hell are you going on about? Oh, come on. Kirishima managed to catch Bakugo in the chest with a shoulder check. You've sent at least 20 people to Recovery Girl today, and one of them was Ciro. You didn't have to go that far. It's not my fault a bunch of weaklings managed to make it past the first event. Bakugo growled, and then hit Kirishima with a much bigger explosion, one that sent him tumbling end over end. Kirishima struggled to his feet and spat out a trickle of blood. It's not manly to beat on those who are weaker than you, and it's even worse to disrespect them. I respect people who are strong, Bakugo snarled. Why do you think I tolerate you? Kirishima was too focused on the fight to register that Bakugo had given him a compliment. Backhanded as it was, that doesn't excuse what you did to Siro. He needed to learn his place, Bakugo said, and then rocketed forward to deliver a series of point-blank explosions. He's got a useful quirk, but he has no business fighting me. Deku really surrounded himself with friends almost as worthless as him. Hiroshima powered through the pain and smashed his forehead against Bakugo's nose. He tried not to feel just the tiniest bit satisfied at the crunch of broken cartilage. How can you say that about Midoriya? He stopped the Namu guy, and he won the first two events. It wasn't exactly manly to say the next part, but Bakugo's ego really needed checking. And he beat you in the battle trial. From the way Bakugo's eye twitched, he hated the reminder, and he took it out on his opponent. With a feral roar, Bakugo hurled a series of rapid-fire explosions that quickly wore down Kirishima's hardening. In seconds, his quirk reached its limit, and he was left on one knee, panting and scorched. It doesn't matter if Deku beat me before, Bakugo said, voice muffled from his broken nose. He won't beat me again. Nobody will. Instead of finishing things off with an explosion, Bakugo just drew his fist back and cold-cocked Kirishima across the jaw. The redhead collapsed in a heap. Kirishima is unconscious. Midnight pointed at Bakugo. We have a winner. The crowd erupted into applause. This fight had been much fairer, and to the audience, Bakugo had been almost merciful in how he had ended things. Bakugo crossed his arms and jerked his chin at his fallen opponent. He's alive, right? Midnight almost rolled her eyes. I'm sure he'll be fine. Recovery girl will have him good as new in no time. You should see her about that nose, though. Yeah, okay. Hiroshima was unconscious, so he never saw the look on Bakugo's face. It wasn't his usual scowl or a smile of superiority, but something else. Not even Bakugo could put words to what he was feeling, but he shoved them to the side for now. He could think about things after he beat Midoriya and asserted his position as the best in class. That was. Iraraka trailed off. Yeah, Midoriya said uncertainly. Bakugo is like that. I was hoping Kirishima would win, Ashido whined. Darn, that just means that Yamomo has to fight him. She turned to the girl in question. Can you take him? Yeyurazu, now wearing a fresh uniform, was slowly eating a high-calorie protein bar. Maybe, she admitted. There isn't much I can create before he gets in close, and he's very unpredictable in a fight. I'll have one shot, and if it fails, I'll lose. Just cover your face, Ciro advised, and tapped a finger against his bandaged scar. Yeah, we can't have the prettiest girl in class lose her title, Ashido said with a grin. Um, yeah Momo. Yeah Yorazu turned to Midoriya, who looked worried. If you w want to go over s some tactics b before your match with Bakugo, I am might be able to help. Yeah Yorazu smiled fondly at him. I appreciate the offer, but I think you'll have to focus on your own match. It's up next, if I'm not mistaken. Oh, right. Midoriya swallowed nervously, and then held out his notebook. Pages 13 through 17 have everything I noticed about new strengths Bakugo has shown today, and how to counter them. Pages 6 through 8 have everything I learned about your abilities today, if they can help. Yeyurazu took the notebook, and Ashido ruffled Midoriya's hair. That is so sweet, Midori. I'm sure that'll help, but you'd better get down to the waiting room. Cementos is already fixing the arena, and Todoroki is gone. Midoriya realized that, indeed, Todoroki had already left. Officially, there was still another 30 minutes before the semifinals started, but the competitors were encouraged to spend that time centering themselves. W well, wish me luck. Good luck, Deku-kun. Yuraraka raised one fist into the air. 
I know you can do it. All of his friends, minus Ida who Asui had said had been called away for a personal matter echoed her words. He gave his usual, wobbly smile, and left. As soon as he was gone, Ashido whirled around to look Yuraraka in the eye, her expression completely serious. He is gonna be okay, right? He's been getting more and more nervous, and Todoroki has been scaring the crap out of me all day. Yuraraka looked uncertain. I don't know, Deku-kun seems to know what he's doing, but Todoroki-san is just so strong, and he's only using half of his power. Come on, guys, it's Midoriya we're talking about, Siro said. He'll be fine. Heck, even if he gets hurt, he can just turn into his swamp fire form, and he'll be good as new. I hope you're right, Ribbit. Asui leaned back in her chair. I guess all we can do is wait and see. Tenya's father was as measured and responsible as anyone in the Ida family, especially since he was a retired hero. However, he drove to the hospital at a speed that could almost be considered reckless. Had Tenya not been so focused on his brother, he might have lost a few years of his life from terror. As it was, neither Ida spoke. The elder was concerned with getting to the hospital as quickly as possible without dying, while the younger had almost shut down. Amazingly, the drive took almost 20 minutes less than it should have. Even with almost no traffic most of Japan was glued to whatever screen could show the sports festival. Still, the car hadn't even finished screeching to a halt before Tenya and his father opened the doors and ran out. Tenya wasn't sure what his father said or did to get them through the waiting room in fact. He didn't recall waiting at all and might have just charged straight through. They would have torn the entire hospital apart in their effort to find Tensei, but luckily, Tenya's mother found them before they rampaged too far, and she guided them to a room guarded by a pair of police officers. By then, Tenya had calmed down enough to ask his mother questions. What happened, mother? It was the hero killer. The words sent a chill up Tenya's spine. The hero killer, Stain, had been a blight on hero society for months. He had killed dozens of heroes and crippled many more. The idea of either fate befalling his brother was too much for Tenya to consider. Tensei and a group of his psychics were following a lead in Hasu City, but they were ambushed. And Tenya swallowed the lump that prevented him from speaking. And how are they? How is Tensei, mother? His mother's smile finally broke through the tunnel vision afflicting Tenya. Ask him yourself. The police let them in, and Tenya felt hot tears fall down his face as he saw his brother. Unlike Tenya, Tensei didn't wear glasses, and though he was older, he had a youthful exuberance that seemed out of place when near his stiff-necked younger brother. His bandages were obvious, even under his hospital gown, but he was awake, he looked exhausted, but when his family arrived, he smiled. Hey, little brother, Tensei said. Tensei staggered closer. Tensei, are you? To the protest of an attending nurse, Tensei swung his legs over the edge of the bed and reached over to pull his brother into a hug. I'm going to be okay, he said, his voice quiet, but full of strength. Tenya finally let the dam break, and he sobbed while his family surrounded him in an embrace. Forget the sports festival. Tenya would have been fine with never even competing if it meant knowing that Tensei would be alright. This is your last chance to take the training wheels off, Ben said as Midoriya walked to the arena entrance. Midoriya was about to reply, but as he turned the corner, he nearly ran headfirst into. Hello, Endeavor. The number two hero crossed his arms and looked down at Midoriya. The way the man narrowed his eyes made Midoriya think he was being studied, and Endeavor wasn't impressed. So, you're the boy who's been impressing everyone at UA, Endeavor rumbled. Rumors were spreading about you even before the sports festival began. Midoriya blinked. I H have. There are. Endeavor raised an eyebrow, barely seen behind his flames. You're either humble or ignorant. Try to accept praise, boy. Or your humility will make you look weak and always be aware of what people say about you. Or the rumor mill will destroy you as completely as any villain. Midoriya nodded. Though Todoroki's earlier conversation about Endeavor had him wary of the hero. He couldn't deny that the man was giving him good advice. I know that your match against Shoto is about to start, Endeavor continued, but I wanted to make a request of you. I'm sure you're aware that my son is not using his quirk to its fullest potential. As a hero, that is unacceptable. Heroes must give their all to their work, or risk failure and death, either their own or those of civilians. Again, Midoriya nodded. Everything Endeavor was saying made sense. My request is that you force Shoto into using his fire. Endeavor narrowed his eyes. He needs to be backed into a corner, to see that the only way for him to be the very best is to use what I have given him. He smirked. Of course, this will undoubtedly challenge you greatly. Do not take offense when I say that I want Shoto to win. Not just against you, but the entire sports festival. He will take his rightful place as the top hero in Japan. Without another word, Endeavor stepped around Midoriya and walked away. But he only made it a few feet before Midoriya spoke. I already know that your son has to use all of his quirk. 
he said, and Endeavor stopped. I want to help him with that. But everything after that is his choice, not mine, not yours. Endeavor glanced back over his shoulder. Had he been anyone else, he would have sneered. We shall see. As soon as the man left, Midoriya sank to his knees, and Ben knelt in front of him. Dude, you okay? Th that was T terrifying, Midoriya stammered. W why does N no one talk about how s scary he is? Ben smiled dryly. He's strong, and that makes him popular. Remind you of anyone? A certain blonde classmate came to mind, but Midoriya didn't say anything. Instead, he took several deep breaths, just as Ben had taught him. Good, Ben said, just keep breathing. Are you good to go? Midoriya nodded. It was shaky, but he managed. Yeah, I can do this. I need to do this. Ben smiled and then vanished. Midoriya got to his feet and stepped into the arena. Let's get ready for the first semifinal match. Present Mike shouted. Both our fighters have proven to be front runners throughout the entire sports festival. But now, we'll find out who's truly top dog between them. First up is the walking mystery himself. The shape-shifting surprise give it up for Midoriya Izuku. The stadium rocked with cheers, but as before, Midoriya looked at his classmates in the stands. Yuraraka and Asui waved at him with both hands and the latter included her tongue while Yeyurazu, Ashido, and Siro all grinned as they cheered. The rest of the class that was present was also enthusiastically supporting him. That was enough to bolster Midoriya's wavering spirit. And his opponent a kid as ferocious as he is composed, he's the world's scariest thermostat. Let's hear a big round of applause for Todoroki Shoto. It was hard to tell if Todoroki received more cheers than Midoriya, but it was definitely close. Todoroki's gaze bored into Midoriya with a disturbing level of intensity. This is it, Midoriya, Todoroki said, barely heard over the crowd. Today, I show everyone that I'm beyond endeavor. Midoriya just held up the ultimatrix, hand hovering over the dial. First, you have to beat me, Todoroki-san. Are both fighters ready? Midnight asked, and got two nods, neither boy broke eye contact. All right, begin. Ice exploded forward, and there was a flash of green light. The stadium rumbled as a massive glacier of ice formed. Nearly everyone in the audience either ducked or threw up their hands to shield their faces as the ice came dangerously close. Cementos had to raise several thick walls to protect those closest to the arena itself. Wow, would you look at that? Present Mike tried to sound nonchalant, but it was impossible to completely hide the awe in his voice. Todoroki showed us all once again why he's such a force to be reckoned with. Did he beat Midoriya in a single, overwhelming blow? Todoroki panted lightly, his right side coated in a thin layer of frost. It had been a risk to unleash that much power, but it was worth it to prove that nobody, not even Midoriya, could stop him. He was about to turn to midnight and ask her to call the match, but then the stadium rumbled again. This time, the source came from the opposite side of the ring. A large section of ice cracked, and then shattered, and Armadrillo stepped out from the hole he'd created. That was kind of cold, Armadrillo said, and if his mouth had been visible, Todoroki would have seen a wild grin. Whoa, Yuraraka whispered, her breath coming out in a thick mist from the cold. I knew Deku-kun was strong, but, forget strong, Siro interrupted, he just walked through Todoroki's strongest move. All Asui could manage was a weak rivet, the sudden cold had weakened her considerably, and Ashido hugged her in an effort to keep her warm. Despite the spikes of ice mere feet from her, the pink girl was grinning madly. Go get him, Midori. I don't believe it, folks. Present Mike was even more enthusiastic than the cheering crowd. Midori's latest form just punched through that ice like it was nothing. Does this kid ever stop? Actually, Aizawa said, and in the commentator's booth, Present Mike stared as his friend actually sounded excited. I think this fight is just getting started. He's right, you know, Armadrillo said, and cracked his knuckles. I'm not even warmed up yet. Todoroki glared at him. So you can handle a widespread attack. What about when it's focused right at you? He placed his hand on the ground, and a massive spike of ice shot straight at Armadrillo's chest. The alien mirrored Todoroki's movements, and his jackhammer arm created a powerful tremor. As soon as the shockwaves reached Todoroki, they not only sent him sprawling, but they shattered the ice into pieces. What chunks did hit Armadrillo just bounced off of his armor? Looks like it's you who doesn't deal well with focused attacks, he said, and took a few steps forward. One directed earthquake, and your ice falls apart. Shut up. Ice crept around Armadrillo, and more spikes lanced towards him. I'm not going to lose here. Neither am I. Another tremor shattered the base of the spikes, robbing them of momentum. Besides, I already know how this will end. Anyone with eyes could see it. He pointed at his opponent. You can't handle using that much ice, can you? Todoroki glanced down at his right side. The frost was already thicker, and it was getting hard to move. Too bad you can't use your fire. Then, you'd be able to balance out your ice and not get frostbite. 
Armadrillo taunted. Oh, wait, it's not about whether or not you can, you just refuse to. I don't need that bastard's power. Todoroki tried to freeze the ground, only for it to be shattered by another tremor. Damn it, face it, Todoroki, Armadrillo growled, your ice can't reach me. Of course, I don't really have a defense against fire. Todoroki stared at him. What is this? What are you trying to do? I'm trying to get you to open your eyes, before you kill yourself because of your own pride. Armadrillo clenched his fists. You look like you've got frostbite, and this fight's just getting started. I don't need you to look out for me, Todoroki snarled, and sent another wave of ice that Armadrillo shattered. And I don't have the same kind of limit as you, Armadrillo said. All I have to do is keep this up until you freeze yourself. I thought you wanted to beat me, to show the world you didn't need endeavor. I don't need that bastard's quirk. Armadrillo laughed, but it was a harsh sound. All you're doing is letting him win. Todoroki froze, and it had nothing to do with his quirk. What are you talking about? Inwardly, Armadrillo cheered. Finally, he's listening. If you use just your eyes to become the greatest hero, you've still let him influence you. You're devoting your whole life to sticking it to endeavor which means everything you do is still revolving around him. You don't need to let him rule your life, just be the hero you want to be. Todoroki shook his head, but it was clear that his resolve was wavering. I won't use his. It's not his quirk. Armadrillo shouted. It's yours. You choose how to use it, no one else. It was as if time stood still. That simple declaration made Todoroki freeze, even as his mind was rocked to its core. Is it? Is it really so simple? So obvious. Todoroki looked down at his hands trembling from cold or emotion. He couldn't tell. Well, Todoroki. Armadrillo stomped forward. What's it gonna be? There was a pause. The crowd was roaring. But for the two boys, there was only silence and the distance between them. Then, with a primal howl, flames erupted from Todoroki's left side, rising nearly as high as the glacier he'd created before settling back down. The ice on his right melted away, and life surged through him once again. The power he'd denied for years gave Todoroki such a rush that he couldn't help the mad grin that crossed his face. I'm going to be a hero, he said, just loud enough for Armadrillo to hear. One that chooses his own destiny. Good to hear, Armadrillo said, and then crouched low. I want to be a hero like that, too. Thank you, Midoriya, Todoroki thought as he aimed his left hand at someone he suddenly wanted to call friend. Just remember, you wanted this, so don't complain. An enormous column of fire ripped through the ring almost instantly melting and then evaporating the ice still scattered about. Cementos had to shield the audience from the waves of flame. Once again, people ducked down to avoid getting hurt. When the fires died down, Todoroki now with his shirt burned off and panting heavily looked around. The ring was blackened by his fire, but he didn't see Midoriya. The only thing out of place was the hole in the ground. Wait, Todoroki had less than a second to stare down at his feet, before a yellow arm punched up through the ground. The fist on the end of that arm connected solidly with his jaw and sent him flying up. The rest of Armadrillo popped up out of the ground. Todoroki started to fall, and Armadrillo drew back his other fist. The punch that landed on his chest was so strong that Todoroki felt his ribs crack, and all the air fled his lungs. The world spun, there was a painful impact, and then everything went dark. Yuraka was practically screaming in her seat, as were Ashido and Siro. In fact, most of Class 1 was losing its collective mind. It's over. Even with his quirk and the arena's sound system boosting his voice, present Mike could only barely be heard over the roaring crowd. Even after that insane level of power displayed by Todoroki, Midoriya Izuku has pulled off the win, both by knockout and ring out. Ladies and gentlemen, we have our first finalist. He won. Yuraka linked arms with Ishido and did a little dance. He won. He did it. Iyarazu stared at Midoriya, now back to normal and checking on Todoroki. I couldn't hear what they were talking about, but it was clear that Izuku was goading him. Was he trying to make Todoroki Sen use his fire? If so, then he was waiting to go underground as soon as he got through to him. He was trying to help Todoroki Sen, but he also wanted to win. She smiled. You really are amazing, Izuku. The older of the two observers laughed. You heard that little speech of his, right? The girl rolled her eyes. He decided that the best place for a therapy session was in the middle of a gladiator fight. The kid is nuts. It worked, and he still won, the man pointed out. You can't complain. Sure I can, the girl snapped. He shouldn't have that watch. It was never meant for him. I'm pretty sure Asma said the same thing a few times, and look how that turned out. The man put a hand on her shoulder. He's doing well. I don't see any reason to take the ultimatrix from him. 
Not yet, the girl muttered. Tensei, what happened to you? Tenya had finally regained his composure and was sitting next to his brother's bed, along with his parents. I know that the hero killer is dangerous, but I thought. I'm not invincible, Tenya. Tensei's words were gentle, but the chastisement was there. Tenya realized then that he'd been subconsciously been putting his brother on a pedestal. My psychics and I did our best, but Stain ambushed us in an alley. You've seen the news, so you know he hit us with knives and a sword. Tenya noticed that Tensei winced and rubbed his back, but didn't comment. He didn't want the image of a madman like Stain stabbing his brother with a sword. That wasn't the worst part of it, though, Tensei continued. He didn't actually hit any of us too badly. In fact, most of us should have been able to keep fighting. At this point, the Ida Patriarch interrupted. Should. What changed? Tensei grimaced. After I got a cut on my shoulder, the hero killer licked the blood on his blade. As soon as he did, I couldn't move. Tenya's eyes widened. For months, experts on the news had speculated that the hero killer had some sort of paralysis quirk. But anyone who had ever actually seen the entire process was probably dead, as Stain's surviving victims had never been able to give much detail. So his quirk involves ingesting blood. Tenya leaned forward. A small part of him, likely the part that had spent too much time with Midoriya, wished he had a notebook to write this all down. You saw it happen. Actually, I didn't. Tensei closed his eyes as he gathered his thoughts. I was told what happened, and not by any of my psychics. See, after I got hit by his quirk, Stain stabbed me in the back. I couldn't move before, but after that, I couldn't I couldn't feel my legs. Tenya's blood turned to ice. But, but, you can move your legs now. Tensei nodded. I'm getting to that. As soon as Stain left, someone else arrived on the scene. I couldn't identify him, and he made sure not to step into anyone's line of sight. He put his hand on my back, and I saw a green light. When it was gone, my injuries well, they weren't completely healed, but I was certainly better off, and I could feel my legs again. He did the same thing to my psychics. While he worked, he told me that he'd seen what the hero killer had done. I reported all of this to the police, but since what this guy said couldn't be corroborated, we have to take it with a grain of salt. He had to have been a vigilante, Tenya said. He has a healing quirk, but didn't stay to provide a statement. Wait, did he leave you in an alley all alone? Tensei chuckled. He called for an ambulance, but he used my phone to do it. What a jerk. Anyway, he left as soon as the sirens got close, so you're probably right that he's a vigilante. Still, I wish he'd stuck around long enough for me to thank him. If Tenya was being honest, he wished the same. He was reasonably sure that this vigilante had saved his brother's career, if not his life. As the conversation drifted to less serious matters, including the sports festival, Tenya made a mental note to bring up what he had learned with his friends. The hero killer has some kind of paralysis-inducing quirk that involves the ingestion of blood, and a vigilante with a healing quirk. I'm sure that Midori will have some interesting theories, but I'll talk to him about that later. He has more immediate concerns right now. As soon as Midoriya rejoined Class 1A, he was nearly tackled off his feet by Yuraraka, who grabbed him by the shoulders and shook him excitedly. Deku-kun, that was incredible. She shouted in his ear. You'll beat Todoroki. Yeah, Midori. Ashido waved her arms excitedly. He was all f -woosh. And you were all no. And then you broke all that ice. And holy crap, you made Todoroki use his flames. Midoriya wasn't sure how to respond, either to Ashido's rapid-fire commentary, or to Yuraraka's enthusiasm. He settled for a weak smile. Thanks, guys. Um, Todoroki-san is going to be okay, according to Recovery Girl. Midoriya, what happened down there? Yeyurazu asked. It was impossible to hear anything, but it looked like you two were having a shouting match for a while. Yuraraka finally let go, allowing Midoriya to take a seat. Well, remember when Todoroki-san pulled me aside before? It has to do with that. Siro nodded sagely, though his attempt to look wise was offset by his bandages. Hey, if it's between you guys, then it's between you guys. Hey, Yamomo. Yeah, Asui tapped the taller girl on the arm. Shouldn't you get ready for your match, Ribbit? Yeyurazu glanced around and saw that Bakugo was already gone. Yes, I suppose I should. Good luck, Midoriya said, as serious as anyone had ever seen him. And be careful. Yeyurazu nodded and tried to look composed, but nobody missed how each movement, normally so graceful, trembled ever so slightly. Her friends wished they could say something to bolster her confidence, but they had nothing. That Hugo was easily one of the best in the class, and while Yeyurazu was no slouch, her opponent's raw talent and combat instincts trumped her intelligence. Still, I'll do my best, she told herself as she walked away. None of my friends would do less, so how can I? In his waiting room, Bakugo killed time by doing some light stretches. It was taking a while to repair the damage done by Deku and Icy Hot. But that was okay in Bakugo's book. 
It gave him time to think not necessarily about his upcoming match, because he'd come up with the perfect strategy as soon as he'd seen Ponytail's fight with Raccoon Eyes. No, for all that he professed that the past didn't matter, he found himself thinking about his previous two fights. Sticky had known he stood no chance against him in a straight fight, but he did anyway. The guy was a worthless extra, but Bakugo gave him points for courage. Hiroshima had withstood far more punishment than he should have, all because he wanted to give Bakugo a lecture. By themselves, each fight would have been little more than a footnote in Bakugo's mind, but they were linked by a common factor Deku. Sticky had gained that little boost of confidence from the damn nerd, and Kirishima had said all those things because he wanted to stand up for him. What makes Deku so special? Bakugo growled, his tone wasn't aggressive, but honestly curious. I get he's strong, so why the hell did Kirishima need to defend him? You know why, a traitorous part of him said. It's because he's still a bundle of nerves, and you did that to him. You made his life a living hell for years, all because he had the spirit of a hero, if not the quirk. You're just upset because now he's got both. Bakugo paused as he digested that, and then did what he usually did he found that part of himself that cared, and then mercilessly beat it back into the recesses of his mind. Besides, he reasoned, Deku was actually worth his time as well, not a rival, because that would imply that he was Bakugo's equal, but he was definitely a worthy opponent. Until he came to UA, Bakugo had never had that. But now, there were plenty of people who could at least last long enough in a fight to make him stronger. In that regard, his only regret in this part of the sports festival was not being able to fight all of the strongest in his class glasses, Kirishima, Birdman, Icy Hot, and of course, Deku. At least those five were worth beating down, and maybe Yue could be good for something and help the worthless members of his class become less annoying. All Yue had to do was stop getting on his case about actually showing that he was strong, and maybe he'd start having fun. The light signaling for him to enter the arena came on, and he cracked his knuckles. He still had his original plan to carry out beat as many of Deku's friends as possible to rattle him before they fought. He still needed to put the damn nerd in his place, after all. And now, our last first year semifinal match. Present Mike waited for the roaring crowd to settle down before continuing. Starting with ladies first her quirk puts any magician to shame, and she doesn't even need a hat, it's Yeyorazu Momo. Across the ring, Ponytail reached across herself, but Hugo could tell from the way her right hand rested on her left arm that she was nervous, but at least she looked him in the eye. And her opponent he's been absolutely merciless this entire sports festival, making it to third place in both the previous events. But can he break that barrier and get into the final match? Show your support for Bakugo Katsuki. Bakugo managed to turn his sneer into something resembling a smile, as if he needed support. Okay, you two, Midnight said, keep it clean out there and do your best not to kill each other. Bakugo knew that she was mostly addressing him. He also knew that he didn't really care. Are both fighters ready? Yes, Midnight Sensei. Let's do this already. Midnight would have given Bakugo another pointed look, but he was too focused on his opponent. Begin. Blast Rush Turbo. Bakugo rocketed forward, determined to get in Ponytail's grill before she could make anything. He was fast, but Ponytail could make simple objects even faster. If Bakugo hadn't flown up at the last second, he would have taken an iron pole straight to his face. You're gonna have to do better than that. Bakugo turned to unleash an explosion. Ponytail tried to dive out of the way, and only partially succeeded. There was a cry of pain, and she limped out of the smoke, her leg a bit charred. Bakugo landed and charged, but he had to duck when Ponytail threw another javelin at him. He had about half a second to register the distraction for what it was before she hurled what looked like a water balloon at his feet. Instead of water, it was a slightly opaque liquid that splattered his shoes. The smell instantly told him what she'd hit him with. Glue. He asked incredulously. You think glue is gonna hold me? Not just any glue. Ponytail explained as she backed up. The strongest quick drying cement I could come up with. It started hardening as soon as it made contact with the air. Bakugo snarled, but his shoes were already sticking to the ground. Powerful though his explosions were, they were most effective at closer range unless he really ramped it up, but without his gauntlets, he had to use such a move sparingly. He needed to get close, but Ponytail didn't look like she'd be giving him the chance and stayed far away. Still, he could get free in moments, but it turned out that Ponytail only needed moments. Her exposed stomach glowed as she created. Holy shit, that's a cannon. It was certainly of an older design but its simplicity was probably what allowed her to make it so quickly in the first place. Bakugo was still struggling to move when Ponytail loaded a shell into the cannon, aimed it directly at him, and fired. 
The sound couldn't hold a candle to his own explosions, but the attack wasn't meant to cause injury. Instead, the shell burst apart to cover him in a net made of weighted chains. Oh, hell no. Back Hugo blew apart the net with a pair of explosions, and then, in a move that shocked many in the audience, used another explosion on his own feet. The blast cracked apart the cement, and he was free, sure, it hurt like hell and he probably had a few fractures in his legs, but it was worth it to see the stunned shock on Ponytail's face. With a savage grin, Beck Hugo used another blast rush turbo to get in close. Ponytail's hesitation only lasted a second, but it was enough for him. He landed right in front of her and held both hands a few inches away from her stomach. Die. The explosions that followed were nothing compared to the super blasts he could use, but they were certainly large enough to throw Ponytail out of the ring. The way she limply fell suggested that she was unconscious, and she would have landed on her head, if not for Cementos creating a gentle slide to catch her at the last second. Yeyurazu is unconscious and out of bounds, Midnight declared. Back Hugo wins. The crowd was more enthusiastic than in previous rounds, probably because he'd deliberately shown restraint by his standards, anyway. As he limped towards the infirmary, a thought crossed his mind that had him grinning. I got a knockout and ring out in the semifinals, and I did it faster than you, Deku, he thought. This was just a warm-up for my real win. Just you wait. Ben looked concerned, and only got more so as the match had gone on. Buddy, you okay? Midoriya hadn't said a word during the fight, even as his friends called out words of encouragement for Ye Yurazu, and then cries of dismay as she lost. He hadn't even reacted when Yuraraka grabbed onto his arm when Yeyurazu had taken the hit that resulted in her defeat. Instead, he had kept his eyes locked onto Bakugo, his expression set in a way that rarely showed itself. He was angry. I'm going to destroy him, he muttered, and Yuraraka blinked at the dangerously even tone in his voice. He's hurt two of my friends today. No more. D. Deku-kun. Yuraraka gently shook his arm. You're kinda scaring me. Then frowned. Izuku, you need to calm down. Back Hugo probably wants you riled up, don't give him the satisfaction. Midoriya didn't respond to either of them for a moment, but then took a deep breath. I'm okay, I'm okay. He noticed the looks his friends were giving him, and shrugged. Okay, I'm still mad, but I'm in control. He pulled himself free from Yuraraka and stood up. I'm going to be in the waiting room. Hey, Midoriya. Siro glanced back at where Back Hugo had been. What are you gonna do out there? It's like I said. Midoriya took long, deliberate strides down the stairs. I'm going to destroy him. Ashido waited until he was gone before speaking. Yeesh. I guess it's true what they say about the timid ones. I'm worried about those too, All Might said. His fingers laced together in front of his face in a way that was too similar to Sir Night Eye for Grand Torino's liking. Who? The boys. Torino frowned. Do you know something about them? Yes, but I have only the most circumstantial of evidence. All Might's voice held a level of frustration that he rarely showed to anyone, even Night Eye and Torino. Young Bakugo and young Midoriya have known each other for most of their lives, but it seems that young Bakugo was quite the bully. Night Eye frowned, and such a boy was admitted to UA. Again, there's no direct evidence, since his previous schools did their best to hide it. All Might sneered. No school wants to ruin the chances of a prospective hero. Torino scowled. Great, we've got one of those brats running around. Has he been a problem at UA? Not really, not since his first day at school. All Might coughed up a little blood, but wiped it away with a handkerchief before it dribbled onto his suit. He's followed the letter of the rules, if not the spirit. The worst part is that he could be an amazing hero, but his attitude All Might shook his head. It reminds me of Endeavor at his worst. He always had that inferiority complex with me and a superiority complex with everyone else. I feel the same happening with young Bakugo regarding young Midoriya. Night I took a moment to wipe his glasses. Mirio spoke to me about Midoriya a few days ago. He mentioned that Midoriya was quite close with a handful of classmates, including two of Bakugo's opponents. If Midoriya had a negative childhood, it stands to reason that he would be protective of anyone who showed him genuine friendship. Bakugo's actions today might backfire spectacularly, but only if Midoriya keeps his cool out there. Torino chuckled, but there was no humor in it. Yeah, I'd hate for the little broccoli kid to lose it here, when he's so close to winning it all. All Might sighed. We'll soon see. Okay, so you're mad. I get it, Ben said as Midoriya closed the door to the waiting room. But please tell me that you're not going to sink to Bakugo's level. I'm not, Midoriya replied as he sat down and began writing in his notebook. 
I just don't feel like being nice. Back Hugo wants to beat me. He can't bully me like he used to, so he wants to put me in my place. I have to beat him, not just because I want to prove that I can be a great hero, but because I know how Back Hugo thinks. The more he focuses on beating me, the less he'll focus on hurting any of my friends. Ben sat on the edge of the table. So, what? You're going to protect your friends by being a punching bag and letting Back Hugo be a total. Midoriya looked up when Ben stopped talking and was surprised when he saw the hologram flickering wildly for a moment. What was that? Ben looked at his hands. Tiny fault in my holographic matrix also. My programming doesn't like it when I try to swear, apparently. He shrugged. I'm gonna run some self-diagnostics, just to be safe. Can you please promise that you'll take the high road during your fight? Midori aside. I promise not to put back Hugo in the hospital. But I am going to completely defeat him today. Fair enough. Ben vanished. Good luck, buddy. In his room, Shigaraki scratched at his neck. So, the brat made it to the finals, huh? He glanced at the pile of notes he'd scribbled down. Maybe all this work isn't for nothing. At first, Shigaraki had viewed this assignment as little more than homework. But as the sports festival had gone on, his opinion had changed. It was like going through a dry run for a raid, studying the different modes a boss might take during a fight and after the USJ attack and everything he'd seen today. He had to admit that Midoriya was definitely at or near boss level. He definitely didn't have boss level fighting experience, but his sheer variety made him a huge threat. All Might was still the prize, but there were other encounters on this raid, and they needed to be removed. Killing them was still on the table, but it would be far more efficient to just get them out of the way, at least until All Might was dead. Anyone in that fight couldn't waste their high damage, long cooldown moves on anyone else. With the symbol of peace in the grave, every other boss would have such a debuff that killing them would hardly be worth the XP. So far, the other bosses were easy to read, the internet was such a great tool for figuring out their combos and their weaknesses. Midoriya, on the other hand, was going to be a problem. If Shigaraki was going to get him off the board, he'd need something special a team. Not just a few gnomus, who were little more than NPCs, but other players, who could intelligently work together. He'd have to train them up, of course, or hope to get lucky and find players who had already made it to a high level. But it was doable. Definitely not a waste of time, he admitted. If anything, this was getting fun. This is it, folks. Present Mike sounded like he was bouncing in his seat. You wanted it, I wanted it, and our two fighters definitely wanted it the final match of the first year sports festival. Midoriya was calmer than before as he walked into view, though he did jump a little at the sheer volume of support. He hadn't really thought about how he'd quickly become a crowd favorite. Back Hugo, on the other hand, couldn't stand still. He bounced up and down on his heeled feet, fingers curled and a wide grin stretching across his face. In all the years Midoriya had known him, he had never seen Bakugo so eager. First up is the blonde berserker. The explosive extraordinaire shows some love for Bakugo Katsuki. For once, Bakugo tried working up the crowd, beating his chest once and then holding up his arms. Midoriya was surprised, but if Bakugo had really been looking forward to this match so badly, it made sense that he wanted the crowd as pumped as he was. And his opponent is the kid who keeps us all guessing with what he'll turn into next. He's slimy, creepy, fast and strong. He's every shape and size. Let's hear it from Midoriya Izuku. If the noise from before had been loud, it was nothing compared to now. The ground under Midoriya's feet shook from the screams and cheers. Once the crowd settled, Midnight stepped between the two boys. Okay, kids, just remember that one of you is still getting second place at your first sports festival. That's nothing to be ashamed of, so keep it under control. As much as Midoriya wanted to beat Bakugo, he knew Midnight was right. Sure thing, Midnight Sensei. Bakugo scoffed. Let's just do this already. Seeing as how both boys had basically signaled their readiness, Midnight stepped out of the ring and held up her whip. All right, begin. Hey, Deku, notice something. Bakugo held up his bare hands. No gloves for you to soak, so there's nothing that shitty lobster form of yours can do to stop me. Midoriya activated the Ultimatrix. Then it's a good thing I've got other options, Kakin. Bakugo's eye twitched at the mocking tone used to say his old nickname, and he rushed forward, even as Midoriya slammed down the Ultimatrix's dial. Bakugo delivered an explosion-assisted fist right at where he assumed Midoriya's chest was. Instead of a satisfying smack of a blow well struck, there was a loud clang, and he reeled back, his fist throbbing with pain. Once again, Midoriya had used a form no one had seen before. This one was taller than an average person, and much wider. His entire body was covered in gray armor, and he looked almost like a furnace that had grown arms and legs. The center of his flat-topped helmet was a grate that glowed orange, and the hourglass dial was on the center of his chest. Okay, what's this one called? 
Back Hugo asked as he put some distance between them. I call him NRG. The armor clanked as he took a step forward and spoke with a Russian accent. I figured you'd use your unpredictable style of attacks, so I picked something that can take anything you can dish out, no matter what angle you come at me from. Oh, you think so? Back Hugo grinned, and then propelled himself into the air. Let's see just how much you can take. NRG reflexively held up his arms as Bakugo rained down explosions. Though the blast didn't hurt, it sounded like a bell was being rung inside his head, and that was getting annoying. Bakugo landed near the edge of his side of the ring, ready for NRG to charge. Unfortunately for him, NRG had no intention of stomping around. Instead, the grill on his helmet glowed brighter. That was all the warning Bakugo had before a beam of orange energy shot at him. Shit. Bakugo's reflexes were as sharp as ever, and he managed to launch himself into the air before the beam of radiation hit where his feet had been a second earlier. Of course, he had planned for Bakugo to move in time. NRG had to be extremely careful with that power, radiation was no laughing matter. He made sure to only aim at the ground, he didn't want to risk accidentally shooting into the audience, even with Cementos nearby. Good dodging, Kaken, NRG called out. I'm sure plenty of heroes will notice how skilled you are at running away. Bakugo's only response was to bombard him with even stronger explosions, which sent NRG staggering. He had expected this to happen. After years of analyzing Bakugo's quirk, he knew that his explosions only got more powerful as he sweated more, which meant longer fights worked in his favor. I'm also good at chasing. Bakugo sneered as he landed on top of NRG's head. Don't you remember? Bakugo jumped off, but only so that he could deliver a point-blank super blast. He winced from the pain in his right arm but switched to his left to deliver a series of rapid-fire blasts into the cloud of smoke he'd created. When the dust settled, he saw the massive crater, with NRG at the bottom. His armor was scuffed and dented, but he appeared otherwise okay. Yeah, I remember, NRG said as he got to his feet. I remember how you'd torment a quirkless kid, just because you could and nobody stopped you. I'm sure that made you feel real strong, right? All that talk about being a great hero, and you went out of your way to beat up someone who couldn't even fight back. Bakugo sneered again. That was your damn fault for always trying to hang out, Deku. You should have just stayed out of my life. I did. Bakugo was surprised by the anger in NRG's voice. Don't you remember when I hardly ever talked to you in middle school? You hunted me down, all to put me in my place. Why? Because I wanted to be a hero. Before I got my powers, you were positive I'd fail at getting into the hero course, so you weren't threatened. So, what? Did you just make my life miserable because it was fun for you? When Bakugo didn't answer, NRG sighed. Whatever, I'm done trying to make you into a better person. If you're going to change, do it yourself. Now, I'm just going to beat you and make sure Siro and Yamomo didn't actually get seriously hurt. His immediate response was to get blown further into his crater by another super explosion. His armor was dented further, but he got back to his feet. You're going to beat me. Bakugo almost laughed. You haven't laid a finger on me yet, Deku. You're right about that, NRG said, and moved his hand over the Ultimatrix dial. I just wanted you to waste your big explosions, Kaken. Bakugo's eyes went wide as NRG vanished in a flash of green light. What's this? Present Mike's enthusiasm was in stark contrast to Bakugo's alarm. It seems that Midoriya has finally transformed mid-battle. So far, he's only used one form for every event and match today. This was probably his strategy, Aizawa said. He wanted Bakugo to use his best move, and then turn into something that would give him an easier fight. The green light had faded by now, but there was nothing in the crater no new form for Bakugo to be wary of, and nothing for the crowd to freak out about. Bakugo's instincts screamed at him, but just as he turned, he felt the pain of a fist in his face. Wait, what just happened? Why did Bakugo fall over? If I had to guess, Midoriya happened. Bakugo stood up, only to get punched again, this time in the stomach. What what the fuck, Deku? Are you ripping off that see-through bitch now? First of all, that's really rude, a sinister voice hissed, and then Bakugo's feet were pulled out from under him. Second of all, yeah, kind of. Finally, Midoriya's latest alien appeared, and this one made everyone a little apprehensive. He only had two thin arms, but no legs, instead, he floated in the air. His body was covered in gray skin. With black lines, he had no mouth, nose or ears, just a single eye, and the Ultimatrix dial looked like it was buried in his chest. I call this one Ghost Freak, he went on. I thought it would be appropriate. After all, you called me a quirkless freak for years. That was one of your favorite insults, right behind Worthless. Bakugo raised a hand to blast him, but Ghost Freak simply sank to and through the ground, leaving Bakugo without a target. Well, Tagata watched as Midoriya's latest form made its debut. 
It's like my quirk. Only he can also turn invisible. Hato shivered. Yeah, but it's kinda creepy. I like the armored form from before. It's hard to tell, since neither of the forms he's used have mouths, Amajiki said. But I think Midoriya was yelling at Bakugo. He was definitely acting angry. That worried the big three. They had seen Midoriya nervous, determined, and eager. But until now, they thought Midoriya didn't have an angry bone in his body. They continued to watch as Midoriya's arm phased up through the ground. His hand turned solid and grabbed Bakugo by the face and then slammed him headfirst into the floor. Should Hato looked at her friends nervously. Should we be worried? Tagata shrugged. For Midoriya, probably not. For Bakugo, I think we should. Tell me, Kakan how does it feel to be totally powerless? Those three covered over him with his arms crossed. How does it feel to know that, no matter how hard you try, you'll never even scratch me? He floated lower, so that he was level with Bakugo as he got to his feet. That's how I felt every day for years. Bakugo spat out blood. Is there a rest stop between here and your fucking point? Not really. I just wanted to say that. I'm done with you. To Bakugo's surprise and confusion. Ghost Freak shrugged casually. It was as if a switch had been thrown. I said what I needed to say. And now, I feel like I can move on with my life. I have friends who care about me, and I care about them. Why should I focus on the crap you put me through, when I can focus on all the good times I'm having with them? Don't get me wrong, you're still a jerk the biggest jerk I've ever met, and I don't think we'll ever be friends but I'm willing to take the high road. I just put you through all that because you wouldn't have listened to me otherwise. Also, you hurt my friends, so, you know payback. Ghost Freak's eye crinkled, and Beck Hugo suspected he was smiling. Now that that's settled, I'll be winning this fight. I've still got plenty of fight left in me. Beck Hugo wasn't wrong. Those hits had hurt, sure, but they were far from debilitating. That doesn't really matter to me. Ghost Freak moved, but though Bakugo's instincts again tried to save him, his body was battered just enough to slow his reflexes, and he wasn't fast enough to stop Ghost Freak from flying into him. It felt like ice flowed through his veins. He tried to fight it, to stop Ghost Freak from getting any further, but it was useless. He stopped struggling almost immediately. His eyes turned black, and ebon lines crawled from the corners of each eye. He then straightened up and looked down at his hands. Midnight took a step forward. Back you go. Are you all right? Back you go smiled. It was bizarre, because the smile on his face was actually friendly. Sorry, Midnight Sensei. Back you go isn't home right now. Midnight flinched. It had been Back you go's mouth that moved, but it was Ghost Freak's voice. Midoriya. Yes, Midnight Sensei. Ghost Freak. Back you go lifted his hands higher, and two small explosions shot out. Huh. So that's how it works. I always wondered. He shook his head and turned back to Midnight. I'm going to take him out of bounds now. Er, uh, okay. Midnight paused as a thought came to her. Are you sure about that? If you're, um, inside him, you'll both be out of bounds, and it will be a draw. Don't worry, I know what I'm doing. Ghost Freak. Bakugo casually walked to the edge of the ring, and the crowd held its breath. Ghost Freak flew out of Bakugo's back. Just as the latter groaned and shook his head, the former pushed him, and Bakugo stumbled over the line. Bakugo is out of bounds. Midnight shouted. Midoriya wins. There was a half-second pause, and then the stadium shook with the force of the cheers. There you have it. Present Mike screamed. In what has to be one of the most exciting sports festivals we've had in years, our first-year winner is none other than Midoriya Izuku. Midoriya turned back to normal and waved at his cheering friends and classmates, just as Bakugo got his bearings. Wait, what? Bakugo whirled and glared at Midoriya. What the fuck was that, Deku? Midoriya shrugged. I won. Bakugo looked down at his feet, still out of bounds. He then stomped over to Midoriya and grabbed him by the front of his shirt. What kind of shitty win is that? He demanded. This was supposed to be a real fight. Why would you use a cheap trick like that? Before Midoriya could answer, a cloud of pink vapor swirled around them. Bakugo fell unconscious almost immediately, and Midoriya wasn't too far behind. He stumbled back, but Midnight caught him. Sorry about that, the teacher said gently. I had to get both of you with my quirk, but I did my best to give you a smaller dose. You'll wake up in a few minutes. Midoriya yawned. Th thanks, Midnight Sun, Z Z Z Z. There was a slight delay before the first year medal ceremony could begin. Midoriya and Bakugo had to recover from Midnight's quirk. Todoroki and Yayarazu still had to be cleared by Recovery Girl, and the arena needed to be repaired once again. Midoriya was still tired, but he was happier than he could ever remember. A year ago, he had been the quirkless outcast of his school. Now, he was attending the most prestigious hero school in the country, arguably the world he had friends, and he had just won the UA Sports Festival. If he was being honest, there was one thing that might have been better than all of that. Yuraka might have been happy for him after his fight with Todoroki, 
but that was nothing compared to now. Deku-kun, that was amazing. Yuraka hugged him tight enough to hurt. You were so cool out there. Maybe it was the lingering effects of Midnight's quirk. Maybe he was just getting used to hugging girls. But Midoriya had no problem returning Yuraka's hug. Thanks, he said. Then, as if it had really occurred to him for the first time, his eyes went wide and he spun in a circle with Yuraka still in his arms. I won. I actually won. Yuraka laughed. She wasn't just happy for him because he won, but because she had never heard such honest joy in his voice before. In that moment, there was no trace of his usual anxiety and hesitation. Instead, he was a happy boy that a small part of Yuraka admitted she might, might, have a crush on. Then the moment was gone, and Midoriya realized where his arms were. He went as red-faced as anyone had ever seen, and he sputtered as he put her down. Fortunately for him, no one teased him, though that was because Kirishima put him in a friendly headlock. Dude, that was so freaking manly. Kirishima shouted. You just took everything Bakugo had to throw at you, and then you just went yeah, I'm done, and kicked the snot out of him. More like he punched the snot out of him, Ashido corrected. That last form didn't have feet. Hey, Midori, what was up with that one, anyway? You were kinda brutal out there not that Bakugo didn't have it coming, but still. Midori's smile faded a little. W well, Ghost Freak is a little weird. I'm not really a fan of using him, even if he's really useful, but he makes me feel mean. That was more true than he was willing to say in front of people. He had intended to give Bakugo a piece of his mind, but before he'd possessed him, he had felt sick pleasure in returning even a fraction of the pain Bakugo had caused him over the years. Ben had warned him about Ghost Freak when he'd first unlocked that particular alien. Some of the original personality could bleed through if he was stressed or angry enough, apparently. The real Ben had even had to fight Ghost Freak when he'd gained self-awareness and escaped the Omnitrix, but that was no longer a concern. Still, Midoriya decided not to use Ghost Freak unless he had to. Still, you were able to reign in your demons before it overwhelmed you, Takoyami said. I have some experience with that, if you want to master that form. Midoriya smiled and nodded, but then Asui tapped his arm. Ribbit, the medals are going to be handed out soon. Midoriya, you should get out there. All right, thanks, Suyu. He smiled at Yeyarazu and Todoroki, sporting fresh uniforms and plenty of bandages. Are you guys ready? Yeyarazu nodded tiredly. I'm certainly proud, but I'm more looking forward to getting home and sleeping in. Same, Todoroki said. The boy looked half asleep, but managed to stay on his feet. However, after the rest of the class headed out to the area in front of the repaired ring, he turned to Midoriya. Thank you, by the way. F for what? Everything you said during our fight. Todoroki sighed. I have a lot to think about, but I'm going to start using my left side. He paused and glanced at Yeyarazu, who smiled understandingly and put some distance between them. I spoke to Endeavor after I woke up. You did. Sudden worry clouded Midoriya's features. Are you okay? Todoroki smirked. The bastard works me hard, but he wouldn't dare hurt me. I'm his best chance at beating All Might, after all. Actually, he was just well, not happy, but he was satisfied that I'd used my flames. He offered to teach me to control them better and I accepted. Really? I thought you, well, hated him. Oh, I still do, Todoroki said with a shrug. But he's still unquestionably the best fire quirk user in generations. If I'm going to use my flames well, I need to learn from the best. Th that's good. Midoriya noticed Yeyarazu waving them over. We should hurry, they're going to start soon. Where's Bakugo? Todoroki looked around and saw the boy in question standing off to the side. Hands shoved in his pockets and covered in bandages. He didn't look as furious as before. Instead, he seemed a mixture of thoughtful and grumpy. Never mind, there he is. Yes seems in a better mood, Midoriya said, let's go before that changes. Sure, Todoroki hesitated and then decided to go for it. Hey, Midoriya, can I give you my phone number so we can talk? If you want, I mean. Midoriya thought about it, and how lonely Todoroki seemed at times. Sure, but on one condition. Go ahead. Todoroki tried not to sound apprehensive, but that had been one of Midoriya's default settings for most of his life, so he gave him a friendly smile to calm him down. If you're going to talk to me, you have to talk to all my friends. And then he gently elbowed Todoroki. And if it's alright with you, I'm sure they'd like to be your friends too. I'd like that. I've never had many friends. Midoriya grinned. Then you're going to fit right in. Okay, that's so sweet, I think I just got diabetes. The girl turned to her companion. Can we go now, please? Any more of this and I'm going to start puking rainbows. Fine, fine. The man ruffled her hair. We got what we needed, and we can track him down if we have to. Finally, there was a flash of light, and then it was like they had never been there at all. I am here. All Might shouted as he fell from the sky and landed in front of the podium. 
and I have brought the medals. The crowd cheered as the number one hero arrived. For the audience, today had been one treat after another. Seeing All Might was just the cherry on top. For All Might, he was incredibly happy. He loved to see up-and-coming heroes show what they could do. And the sports festival was only a third of the way done. The fact that the winners of the first year events were all his students filled him with pride. Young Ye Arazu, he said, muting his mic so that his words were for the girl alone. You showed excellent strategic decisions during your matches. With enough preparation, I dare say that you'll be a match for nearly any villain. Ye Arazu blushed and bowed her head. Thank you, All Might Sensei. However, All Might continued, your weakness is that you hesitate when things don't go according to plan, or if you simply don't have time to react. Work on those reflexes, and you'll be a force to be reckoned with. The girl nodded, and then accepted both the bronze medal All Might placed around her neck, and the brief hug he gave her. Young Todoroki, All Might placed a hand on the other third place winner's shoulder. I don't know why you decided to use your flames, and I won't pry. However, this decision will only help your growth, and I know that this is an important step in your journey. Make sure that your footing on this path is secure, starting is easy, but it is even easier to backslide in the beginning. Todoroki met his gaze evenly. I know, I have someone to talk to about that, just in case. All Might suspected he knew who Todoroki was talking about, but didn't comment. Instead, he gave the boy the other bronze medal and hugged him. Ah, young Bekugo. All Might kept up his grin, but it was a little harder, the runner-up had left a bad impression on him early on, and his behavior during the sports festival hadn't done much to improve that. Still, the boy was calm enough now, maybe losing so thoroughly had opened his eyes. There is no shame in coming in second place. This is only your first sports festival, and you have plenty of time to grow. Yeah, Bekugo held up the silver medal All Might placed around his neck. Hey, All Might, can I ask a question? Of course. I can't guarantee I'll give you an answer you'll like, though. Whatever. Bakugo glanced at Midoriya for a second. Does being the best mean proving you're the strongest at everything? Not in the slightest, All Might said, and gently hugged the boy so that he could whisper in his ear. For all that our society loves ranking heroes in popularity, there's really only one person you should ever work to impress yourself. As long as you do your very best, even if you fail, you can walk away from anything with your head held high. Okay, Bakugo frowned thoughtfully. Well, I'm still gonna be the greatest hero ever, that's my goal, and I won't stop until I achieve it. Just you wait, All Might, I'm gonna surpass even you and Deku. All Might wasn't sure what surprised him more that Bakugo seemed to be listening to honest advice, or that he had compared him to young Midoriya. He appeared to have done the latter without really thinking about it. All Might chose to let Bakugo think about things as he moved on to the winner. Young Midoriya, he said, congratulations on winning your first sports festival. You showed determination, creativity, and a compassionate heart, all of which are the best qualities of a hero. You'll go far, I just know it. Midoriya didn't even try to hide the tears pouring down his face. Th thank you, all M might. All might place the gold medal around the boy's neck, and then hugged him, from the way he was trembling. All might was genuinely worried that the fanboy was about to pass out. One more thing, he said quietly. I remember what I said to you, back on that rooftop. I know that you have your quirk now, but it doesn't excuse how I dismissed you. Quirkless or no, that was unacceptable, and I hope you can find it in your heart to forgive me. There was a choking noise, and then Midoriya nodded. All Might smiled and patted him on the shoulder before turning to the crowd. There you have it, folks, he shouted, and the speakers carried his booming voice a fair distance beyond the arena. Give it up for not just our winners, but also everyone who went beyond today. Say it with me. The arena shook with the combined force of thousands of voices. Plus Ultra, the music starts, and the scene opens with UAS rising stars sitting together on a hill. Midoriya points at something on the horizon and smiles. They all get up and begin to run. In the sky, clearly visible in the evening air, is a shooting star. The scene shifts to Midoriya standing in the middle of his room, looking down at the Ultimatrix. Behind him, Ben smiles, even as he flickers. Midoriya is then seen walking down a sidewalk in his school uniform. His friends are around him, talking excitedly. Todoroki is also there, but is hanging back and looks unsure. He then looks up and sees Midoriya gesturing for him to come closer. He smiles and takes a step forward. The scene changes again, this time to a training area. Midoriya has turned into four arms, and is holding up the arm of a UA robot that was trying to crush Uraraka. The two grin, and then the scene flashes forward to the rising stars, including Todoroki, sitting on a pile of destroyed robots and looking exhausted, but happy. Finally, the eight students are heading home. Midoriya is laughing at something Siro says, Uraraka has linked arms with Asui and Yeyurazu, and all three girls are smiling. 
Ashido has an arm around Todoroki's shoulders while she sticks out her tongue at Ida, who is trying to reprimand her. The scene fades to black as it zooms in on Midoriya's smile. So alright folks that's all for today. Stay tuned for part 5. Do subscribe, like and share for more such videos. Also check out the story and author The Incredible Muffin on fanfiction.net. Press the bell icon to be notified first on release. See you in the next video till then goodbye.